So we are uh, ready for our, the afternoon part of our workshop. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Alyssa Brownstein, who is the uh, professor of economics and the associate dean for research and graduate programs in the College of Liberal Arts at Colorado State University. She's also the editor-in-chief at the journal Feminist Economics and a former senior economist for UNCTAD. Her work focuses on the international and macroeconomic aspects of growth and development, emphasizing the interactions between macroeconomic policy and gender equality, as well as the consequences of incorporating care and social reproduction into macroeconomic models, which will be her topic today. She has published widely and prominently on these topics, including in World Development, the Cambridge Journal of Economics, Feminist Economics, Development and Change, and the Journal of Economic Issues, to name just a few and not even mention her policy publications. In addition, Dr. Brownstein worked as a consultant for a number of international development institutions, including UN Women, the International Labor Organization, the World Bank, the UNDP, the UN, and the UN Industrial Development Organization. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Brownstein to offer her proposal for a feminist macroeconomics of care and global reproduction. Okay, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'll try to be enlivening. I know it's after lunch and it's very hot in here, so I appreciate all of you being here. And I also wanted to start out with a little note about me and my positionality right in the field generally i'm a macroeconomist as well as a feminist economist and as one who functions in macroeconomic circles i very much taken on the language right and the mission of macroeconomists in the sense of using quantitative language to be able to advocate for feminist ideas. So in that sense, I think of myself as someone who is internal to the intellectual system, to the intellectual and policy system, working from within. Um, I also think that it's very important to have voices that critique that system from outside. Uh, was another thing I wanted to say. Well, uh, well, oh, the other thing I wanted to say was just about macroeconomics in general, right, and feminist voices in macro, of which are very few, even fewer than in the discipline of economics more generally. I think one of the reasons might be that it's so quantitatively oriented, and even more so, uh, another reason, I think, is because it, it's abstract by definition. We don't experience it directly. Uh, and when you're talking about issues of gender and folks' lived experiences, you, of course, go to the micro. But there are a lot of important political and social questions that exist in the macroeconomic realm. And if feminists and other critical voices are not at the table, we cede a big part of the conversation. So that was the reason I got involved in economics to begin with, right? Being uh, uh, caring about social justice issues. And it seemed like the economists had a lot of the legitimacy at these tables. And, you know, if you can do a little bit of math, not that much, just a little bit, uh, then, you know, it's a good place for you to be to advocate for those issues. So this, I want to look at the time because I'm not going to talk for, for that long, but uh, it's an amalgam of different presentations. I wasn't sure who I was going to encounter here. So some of the slides I'll go over quickly and you'll get a sense of sort of how I present this work. Note that much of this, in much of this work, I am speaking to audiences which or, or who are either skeptical of feminist economic approaches to these questions or audiences, macro uh, economists that don't think about care and social reproduction at all. So you get a sense of how I 
sort of do that. Mm -hmm. So today, I will go quickly over this preliminary part where I review some concepts around feminism, production, and reproduction. It's mostly right for audiences that are unfamiliar with this approach. And then I'm going to give you a broad view of recent efforts to incorporate care in macroeconomics. And then an example from my own work of transforming macroeconomic modeling. And so very quickly, and a lot of this is drawn from uh, my time studying at UMass with Nancy Fulbray. So <laughs> this first part has really fundamental to my sort of foundational understanding of how macroeconomics works. And it's, you know, completely derivative of Nancy's work. So in terms of thinking about feminism, it's, uh, right, it's very important to understand how one's standpoint um, particularly gender in this case, affects your understanding of production, of the production of knowledge and the cho your choice of theory. And the example that I'm sure many of you are familiar with from the sort of mainstream side is this story about Adam Smith and how he lived with his mother most of his life and he never married and so he, you know, in, in thinking about the adage around the brewer, the butcher, and the baker, right, providing his dinner, we know that, in fact, they don't provide the dinner. They just provide the raw materials. When you get home, you have to prepare them. You have to clean up or organize the services that you do. And in Smith's life, most of his life, it was likely that his mother was doing that work for him. But we've inherited this legacy that non-market work, which is not, does not travel, or, or work that does not travel through the market, is excluded from estimates of gross domestic product. Now, the system of national accounts does now include producing for one's own use, right? So the system of national accounts is this UN, right, promoted standards that countries use, country statistical offices, to generate their estimates of output. Uh, but unca unpaid care work is still only encouraged in satellite accounts. And I'm sure we'll get more information about that uh, or more thinking about that when Nancy talks this afternoon. But I also wanted to really recommend this book, The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems, because the left or the heterodoxy within economics has not done that much of a better job of incorporating care and social reproduction. Uh, in this book, Nancy talks about how Marx had a similar view of uh, household work um, and which it excludes producing other people uh, or, or production, excludes producing other people as well as um, producing people. Angles and others, right, have identified with, and I, I see this manifested uh, in students today, including myself, uh, that with the rise of private property, that's when sort of gender inequality commenced. Uh, but in this book, In the Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems, Fulbray talks about how women, young women in particular, could be identified as the first form of property and surplus, the product of war and marauding, uh, which would confer an advantage, right, in societies where having a population advantage confers competitive advantage. So in, in thinking about this, then, patriarchy constitutes a system that is parallel with capitalism. And it is not a product of capitalism, but exists alongside it, sometimes in complement to and sometimes in contradiction to. And so social reproduction, which is very much embedded in patriarchal relations, generates, you know, is important in generating the particular types of capitalisms that we experience today, as well as the kinds of crises that they confront. And I think that the last panel was a really good illustration of understanding that. 
So here is my sort of apologetic slide, <laughs> where you know, I as a macroeconomist, I some I think of myself as sort of a vul a little bit vulgar, right, in the sense of talking about economic growth, especially as one who was in the UN system for a number of years, where you're interacting with policymakers and that's what they care about, and uh, and I think that's reflected in its presence in the Sustainable Development Goals. And you know, part of my argument has been that it's important from a development perspective. It's not the only thing, but increases in per capita incomes are essential for sustained improvements in well-being, right? Uh, and then this point that I started out the talk with, that economies, economists and policymakers care about growth. And if we're not talking about it, we're not in those conversations. Uh, so now I want to tell you about how I operationalize the notion of reproduction in my work. It's very specific. This is a woodcut from the uh, right. It's, uh, it's an image that comes from a German woodcut. But it's from the cover of Nancy's Who Pays for the Kids, which was published right when I started graduate school. And it illustrates this notion. You have a factory in the background and workers coming out of the factory and getting renewed at home every day to go back and enter the factory. And so how I've operationalized social reproduction in this work is to think about it in terms of the time and commodity it takes to reproduce the labor force. So it's very intentionally conceptualized in relation to standard measures of economic growth. Typical growth models, and I don't have time to talk about this today, don't tend to treat labor as produced or maintained. You do get measures of human capital, right? And I think that that can be pretty informative, but human capital tends to refer to only formal schooling. There's no theoretics around how, you know, what it takes to get kids to the door, but also in terms of elder age care. We can talk about health and how, you know, health is operationalized, but I'm not talking about that today. Um, so there are a number of consequences for economic theory and policy decision making for undervaluing care. Uh, Nancy's talked uh, has a, a, an article about you know how neoclassical economics tends to treat children like pets. We have them because they make us happy. Essentially, they have no sort of larger social value. Uh, market efficiencies can be generated simply by transferring labor from you know, the, the, the labor involved in caring for others from the market to the non-market sector. Uh, so models which ignore unpaid care work presume effectively unlimited supplies of caring labor. And these are the kinds of critiques that have underlied uh, feminist critiques of structural adjustment programs, right? And these macroeconomic models that, you know, uh, if you cut spending on health and education, uh, then you know, you'll be able to address the fiscal deficit, but at the same time, it just assumes that whatever occurs as a result of those cuts will be absorbed by the non-market sector. So the key driving question then in this work is, how does allowing for social reproduction change our analysis of various public policies and strategies for growth and development, right? So it is an instrumental argument in that sense, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, sort of unapologetically so in the sense that or not, you know, uh, conscientiously doing it to intervene in a certain world. So feminist macro is a very broad area that looks at effectively the dual lines of causality between macroeconomic dynamics, policies, and outcomes, and gender equality and gendered well-being. So. Uh, studies that look at the impact of macro on gender tend to focus on the differential gendered impact of macro structure on policy on women versus men. Um, others, to the extent where data is available, also look at racial and gender differences at the same time. 
uh, probably the most familiar example of this is that when countries turn to more export orientation, it increases, or labor intensive export orientation, it increases the demand for women's labor. The other causal direction is also important, uh, which looks at how gender systems affect macroeconomic outcomes, like economic growth. And one of the most important one, which has become a sort of empirical stylized fact, and is probably the most problematic in regard to the instrumental argument for gender equality, is that all else equal, countries which are more gender equal in labor force participation, health, and education grow faster than other countries. Uh, the question about gender wage gaps is one that is more contested, but it's sort of an empirical regularity in modern growth regressions. I think uh, uh, a third area is one that seeks to incorporate accounting for care and social reproduction in all aspects of these connections. So I, I talked about a little bit of the work in the early years of uh, work on care in the macro economy. I think the, the sort of earliest iterations of it focused on structural adjustment programs in the 1980s. Uh, you have this really great article by Nilifer Chatai and Diane Elson on the social content of macroeconomic policy uh, and talks about how the relations of production and exchange are embedded in class as well as gender and how you know it's a really good sort of introductory article to understanding how gender is embedded in all aspects of macroeconomics. And I credit Diane Elson with coining the term the care economy, which is something that has become so commonly used these days, including in the SDGs. It's quite amazing. That's another uh, 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 paper that is waiting to be written is how that appeared there. Um, so in terms of the major strands of feminist work that emerged from these early insights, I group them into three different categories. Uh, one that focuses on national income accounting and, and generating alternatives to GDP as a way to measure well-being. Uh, another set of work disaggregates macroeconomic data for care aware policy analysis and I'll give you an example of that in a second in a second and then mine is uh, a focuses on transforming macroeconomic modeling care and social reproduction and I how long have I been talking for like it feels like 30 seconds <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh you're so sweet all right I'm, I, I'm, I'm just going to glide over this because this is, there's too much here. But, uh, you know, I mentioned the challenge of national income accounting and how there are mounting efforts to replace GDP with a better measure of well-being. But it's still the case that GDP is the dominant metric that is used. So that's why I use it. <laughs> but I, I, I welcome others to have other projects around that. Um, and then the sectoral disaggregation for, for care-aware policy analysis is really interesting. There's uh, a, a project that I was involved in, which was led by Maria Floro, and Nancy was also involved in it essentially adds a gender disaggregated household sector to a computable general equilibrium kind of model. I don't love this work I f because I, I feel like it, 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 it's, it's good in the sense that you can, uh, uh, individuals in the household, you, you can track what happens to them in terms of time, allocation, and things like that. Excuse me. <coughs> But it, it seems to me to be not that far beyond Carrie, Gary Becker's notion of Z goods. We can talk more about that in the discussion if you'd like. Some, some uh, work that I like a lot is that has uh, come out of this recently is looking at the differential impacts of fiscal policy spending on physical versus social infrastructure. And in particular, for the same amount of spending, one can get 
uh, many more jobs and much higher multipliers uh, in terms of the impact of that government spending by spending on social infrastructure. And there are a number of studies that have been done in particular country contexts. I think one aspect, and, and I think it's very powerful uh, in terms of, you know, it's connected to uh, gender budget analyses and uh, looking at the differential gendered effects of spending. I think an open question here in this literature is what are the longer term productivity effects? Because of course, spending on physical infrastructure has returns later, right? Better roads and sewage and electricity uh, has impacts later and crowds in other types of investment. I think there's a lot more work to do in terms of understanding how social infrastructure generates uh, better things in the future. <laughs> and that's part of, you know, what I focus on here. <clears throat> I'm going to skip that. So my, uh, whoop. so my work in this project is, uh, combines a number of efforts that I've done with other folks over the years, uh, that started in 2011 and most recently uh, resulted in a, a paper in 2021, but it started with a theoretical macro model that was very much based on uh, heterodox post-Keynesian, Kaletskian type of model. Uh, and then I applying it to country specific cases and imperial, empirically estimating social reproduction regimes and then putting it in growth regressions. So I want to give you just a taste of what it looks like. So uh, social reproduction takes place in the household, which is just a, uh, it's not a, an actual physical place, but it's a place in the model <laughs> where it happens. It can also incorporate the community. Commodities and time are inputs into social reproduction, and it's the output is what I call human capacities. It's more narrow than Sen's notion of human capabilities because it's focused on whatever makes people more economically productive, but it's wider than the notion of human capital in the sense that it includes like emotional maturity. There are two time horizons, or two time horizons to production. There are the daily aspects of social reproduction. All of us, like, we're feeling kind of tired and I feel a little sweaty <laughs> right now. And right there's some recovery that we will engage in. But then there are also long-term investments, the kind of human capital types that raise uh, long-term productivity and contribute to current demand. So there are a couple of ways that this model is gendered. There's a gender division of labor, both in the distribution of the time and monetary costs of social reproduction, and in terms of gender segregation in labor markets. So folks can contribute time or money to social reproduction to buy substitutes. Um, there's a demand side, like all econ models, and a supply side. The demand side, for those of you who are familiar with these kinds of models, uh, the, uh, it's, there, there are two stylized types of economies. And whether they are care-led or inequality-led depends on the relationship between gender equality and the labor market and economic growth. Where more gender equality gives you higher growth, they're care-led. Where more gender equality lowers growth, it's inequality-led, right? So for those of you who are familiar with these models, right, it parallels profit-led versus wage-led. And so the big divider that we focus on is what we call caring spirits. Yes, it parallels Keynes animal spirits, but caring spirits refers to the tendency, whether determined by social norms or individual motivation or public preferences, as reflected in the structure of the social welfare state, to provide care or support for care, right, by providing money <laughs> for oneself and others in ways that add to current aggregate demand and future productivity. 
So in care-led economies, caring spirits are strong, and they can be strong because of the social welfare state or because of uh, community norms, either one. Uh, in economies where they're weak, these are inequality-led. The model also incorporates, um, and when I say model, I'm talking about these variables, right, that relate to one another. You can, uh, there are also macro policy variables and macroeconomic structure variables. Usually I'm talking to um, audiences that are involved in development economics, so I talk about uh, production orientation, but I don't have time to talk about that today. Then we estimate the demand structure uh, by using principal component analysis. And that's where you combine a lot of different things <laughs> into one number. And the number itself doesn't mean anything. The number, it means something in relation to the other numbers that you've um, estimated. And so the big thing here is how do you estimate caring spirits? And you know, backing up macroeconomist doing cross-country panel data analysis, interested in development questions. How do you come up with a measure of caring spirits that you can find over a long period of time for a lot of countries? So what we ended up using was uh, disaggregating the human development index, right, which includes uh, elements of income, education, and health. And we posited or argued that countries that have greater achievements in health or education relative to their changes in income, relative to countries in their income group, <laughs> are, have stronger caring spirits because you're seeing the returns, larger returns on health and education from a given return to income. And then we have these others, which I'm not going to talk about. There's also a supply side which depends on the distribution of social reproduction, basically between women, men, and capital. Uh, and there's an interaction between the labor market, the household sector where social reproduction happens, and the product market where wages are bargained over, right? So there's power in the labor market, but also in terms of how social reproduction is managed in the household. And so these interactions of these three different places give you the distribution of social reproduction. And here we have two stylized types of economies, also a high road and a low road. In the high road, the time and financial costs of social reproduction are equitably distributed among women, men, the state, and capital, but through the state. Uh, in the low road, women shoulder a disproportionate share of both the time and the financial costs. And so the way it relates to the demand side is, you know, if you get uh, uh, higher wages and women enter the labor market, what impact does that have on the production of human capacities? In a high road one, in a high road uh, regime, women going into the labor market increases the production of human capacities because they have more money and the substitutes for, that they can buy in the labor market are either really good or their partners or other people in the community substitute for their disappeared labor, right? So they just have more income and their dependents don't suffer as a result. Uh, the opposite case, the low road case, is where you have a decrease. And so from the model, we have all of these elements which are in the lower part of the chart, unpaid care work, public provision for care, that differentiate these two regimes from one another and, and drive the data that we looked for, uh, for the principal component analysis. And these are the elements that uh, we used to measure each of these components. Uh, it, right, it includes public care provisioning, reproductive infrastructure, which is like uh, access to electricity, fuel, sanitation, and water, 
the extent and quality of the market care sector if you can't purchase substitutes for yourself, as in the paper today, right? You're not going to work outside, but the quality of those substitutes is gonna have an impact on the production of human capabilities. Um, and then the gender division of care between women and men. This was a, another interesting uh, piece. We, you know, the UN Women increasingly, right, has collected and centralized a lot of data on uh, time use. And, but for a panel like this, there's not enough. Uh, but we found that this data was very highly correlated, the ratio of women to men in terms of how much unpaid market time they, they put in to the female to male age of first marriage. The correlation was like 0.7 something. So we use that as a proxy. And so you get this two by two table, which I always love to do, because it helps me organize my thinking, and it's a complicated model, you know. So you have the supply of, uh, uh, or the distribution of social reproduction and demand and growth. So care-led and low road together, you get a time squeeze. Uh, so higher wages are good for women and growth, right? But more market participation squeezes time and lowers human capacities production. So growth is elusive or unstable. Its opposite is inequality led with high road, right? The wage squeeze case, where higher wages for women actually lower growth, even though you get more human capacities production. So this is where the supply and demand sides of the economy are contradictory to one another. The two examples where they are uh, complementary are the high road and care led, that's the win-win, right? Uh, which we call mutual because higher wages for women are good for growth and they also result in more human capacities production. The other case is exploitation, higher wages for women, lower growth, and more market participation also squeezes human capacities production. So to the extent that you do get growth, it, it's a result of exploitation. Um, so then we estimate these principal components, and this is an example of what they look like in one of the time periods, 2008 to 2015, and the distribution of countries in that graph, right? So in the top, Right, you have mutual and then around there. And it's an interesting check to see if countries end up where you think they might end up. <laughs> um, and you can also look at the P underlying PCA and understand why some countries are in some places and others. All right. Uh, so this is the distribution. We had 156 countries in our sample, and you can see across regions, and the, the categorization is just based on the UN categorization. You can see across regions the various distribution distributions of different regions. And then we can also estimate time paths because we have this data over time. And so the world in general is getting more, gen for, in terms of its social reproduction regime, is getting more gender egalitarian on the supply side, but it's getting more inequality led on the demand side. Uh, and so it's interesting, some of the work that we did for UN Women, right, was about uh, uh, looking at specific country cases, and if a country is on this particular time path, what can we do to move the time path, right, to a, to a better one, to a win-win one? And then we also did some growth regression analysis to test the predictions of the model, uh, which were broadly uh, 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 confirmed. I won't go into that today. but. You know, the, the takeaways are about the kind of agenda that I try to advocate for, that social reproduction is an important source of current consumption and future productivity growth. So if folks, you know, if policymakers care about that, uh, then they should care about social reproduction. And the gender division of labor, as well as the division between the state and capital, is essential to determining that trajectory. 
Uh, and it's important for us to think more widely about the short and longer term drivers of investment and feminist perspectives can improve macro policy effectiveness. So thank you for your time and attention today. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> we have time for some questions. Questions or comments. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious uh, how you feel about the increasing use of the terminology feminist foreign policy oh. in, uh, and how it relates to the work that you're doing. Good question. I was just thinking about this the other day. I sort of feel like it's... So I think it parallels in, um, in economics, or thinking about at the UN, for instance, that on the one that when I was working at UNCTAD at the UN Conference on Trade and Development, which is really a, ha, was established right in the 1960s to represent the interests of developing countries in global trade negotiations. And so it's very much about advocating uh, for uh, making the global economy uh, supportive of development, right, rather than having free trade goals. And going in there and talking about gender equality and economics, I was very, I met with a lot of criticism because, uh, and, and very helpful criticism because uh, developing country governments, or the G77, you know, the, the advocacy group, felt like that gender equality was a Trojan horse that Western governments used to introduce effectively neoliberal economic reforms, right, to promote sort of free market ideology. Uh, the, right, the, the, the solution for gender equality is to get women more involved in labor markets, to increase their labor force participation. Uh, and uh, I found this to be really helpful. But I also felt, and I will get back to your question, I also felt like it gave me an entree into certain conversations um, and localities that my, my uh, colleagues who talked about class and income inequality could not access. Uh, so, um, it, it helped me in terms of thinking about, you know, having that, that criticism. So an example might be, so I presented this model at the International Monetary Fund like seven or eight years ago. And so I was able to be at the IMF at that moment and talking about class inequality and presenting this weird Marxist macro model uh, because it was focused on gender inequality, right? And so in that sense, I thought it was a real opportunity. And so I feel like it's feminist foreign policy is kind of the same, that it's a, a nomenclature that is adopted without much, without much deep thinking, so it provides opportunities as the, at the same time that it can be risky, right? In, draping foreign policy decisions with this feminist lens. What do you think? <laughs> My gut reaction is to feel good about the yeah. number of countries that increasingly are willing to own up to the individualized effects of yeah. broad foreign policy goals yeah. and to put those effects at the forefront of their decision making. Yes. I mean, it can affect funding priorities of, you know, um, national aid. So, to, in that sense, I think it's good. But I, yeah, totally agree. It's a, it's an opportunity. It's an interesting opportunity. Um, it's kind of related to the previous question, but I feel a little silly asking it now. Um, so thinking about marketing, right? Um, 
so the way that neoliberal sort of feminism is marketed to people is as a girl boss, you know. Yeah. You have to be a girl boss. Sheryl Sandberg wrote a whole book about it, and it was a popular, a very popular book. Um, so how would you market this sort of Marxist informed model of, you know, social reproduction and feminism um, and kind of sell that to people? Yeah. So... So the way, right, that I've done that is through this kind of, right, I talk about gro economic growth, and then I also adopt this quantitative language, uh, which is very much a selling point, you know, uh, in the sense of, you know, you're doing this kind of muscular dance, and you have to show that you can talk this language. Uh, and you can use the tools, and you can come up with nice-looking graphs. And <laughs> but I don't, you know, I don't think that there is truth embedded in that. It's a way of um, making your case, right? Using the prevailing language. Uh, and and I think all of macro is like that. So I, I don't feel like a pretender in any way. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I do get critiqued right from the other side. Like I feel from, you know, in terms of the feminist spectrum, I may be perceived as sort of almost center right, you know, in terms of feminism. But I mean, yeah, so because of the quantitative tools that I use. So there's that aspect also. This is uh, somewhat related, uh, and, and you've mentioned a couple times now the idea of like instrumentalization, you know, this yeah, idea yeah. that that, that care work and social reproduction um, enter these models and are useful and, and are you can make a policy argument for to the extent that they then end up having returns or increasing economic growth or something like that. And so it sounds like, I mean, some of what you're doing, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, gender policies as a Trojan horse. It sounds like uh, to some extent what you're doing is, is using modeling as a Trojan, your own Trojan horse going into, and I'm wondering to what extent do you feel like this would be a useful Trojan horse uh, in to shift the conversation away from instrumentalism and toward uh, care work and social reproduction as you know useful and valuable in and of themselves? Um, yeah, I uh, what a great question. I mean, I think on the face of it, it seems pretty easy in the sense that you could use quantitative you know analyses and change your deep dependent variable from GDP to something else, like, you know, uh, human capabilities, for instance, some measure, or just put the HDI on the left-hand side and do it that way. Um, I have used GDP because of the reasons that I talked about, but also because, you know, these models are really complex, and I really un deeply understand the mechanisms that connect right, these activities to national income in terms of my training and things like that. So it's, in that sense, it's, it's sort of convenient right, for me to embed this. But I, I think that's just the very first step. I think a next one could be changing the dependent variable. Right? So we don't have to value GDP. GDP then becomes uh, an endogenous variable on the, that on the right hand side that determines something else. Right? It, then GDP becomes instrumental, which is the way it should be. <laughs> yeah. So, so China is one of those countries that experienced probably the fastest GDP growth uh, that the world has ever seen for the past 20 years. Um, and then I, I think over those time, there's essentially growing inequality. And then um, what essentially kept the society moving forward is everybody was getting like 
increasing amount of um, figures in their salaries, um, just it's bigger and bigger, bigger numbers stimulating people to keep working forward, right? But I think what happens is um, with this inequality-led growth, um, once you have some kind of stagnation, your whole country just loses momentum. Yeah. So I think the statement I'm trying to trying to talk about is um, essentially having a well-balanced and equal society is important for for long-term and sustained growth. Yeah. So like not non-sporadic, um, just over like over time sustained growth because um, like. The example of China right now is after the whole shutdown after after COVID, um, the whole society, at least a few people I've talked to, um, there's a general consensus of um, doubt, like of where the country is moving forward to, because there's no, there's nothing to back them up. Because when they go back home, it's not a, a respecting and an equal environment they're 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 living in. So once this um, figure number stimulated growth is put onto a hold. Like the so whole society is just put into that big conundrum mm -hmm. because you have given up human welfare mm -hmm. in pursuit of your economic future. Mm -hmm. But I think you have given up so much mm -hmm. in the road of achieving that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm just curious how, what's your opinion on this um, statement? Wow, I, I really appreciate that, um, that explanation. And I think, you know, uh, in the Chinese case, which is so I know a little bit about, <laughs> I know a little bit about it, but right, the, the assumption was that the, the growth will sort of generate enough improvement in well-being in terms of material life and health and other achievements to make up for, for the challenges of having this kind of inequality-led economy. But I think what you're talking about, you can sort of see aspects of it in the model in, the term, in, in terms of the, you know, being in a growth regime which is contradictory in the sense of being, you know, inequality-led uh, or uh, based on inequality and what are some of the problems with that. I mean, particularly in terms of volatility and dependence on external circumstances and things. And, so I wasn't able to talk about it in the model, but there are those elements in the model that would enable you to capture those um, aspects that you were talking about with China. It's very, yeah, it's an interesting case. Hi, um, I'm, I'm curious about the graph you had with the four axes. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, have you been able to looked at decomposing them into thinking about what are the reasons, for instance, they're not in the mutual category, and how are they idiosyncratic across countries, or are they similar? Because it seems to me like some of them were pretty close on the axes there. Is it a relatively small policy that needs to get them up into mutual, or are these going to be, are the, you know, how would they vary across locations? Yeah. So uh, this is something that I sort of, an aspect that I skipped over in the presentation, but that, right, remember the PCA is just a number. And so we put the, the axes we put in relation to where, how the countries are arrayed. So for countries that are very close to the axis, we're not very confident in that estimate. It doesn't really, it could be on that side or that side. So when we run the regressions, what we do is we weight the observation by their distance from the axis. So the ones that are really far into the quadrant have a heavier weight than the ones that are close to the axes. So that's part of the response. But you can also right, look at the components of the PCA for that particular country and what aspects are making it or are having the biggest impact on where it is. I haven't actually done that paper, uh, but you know, let's talk. <laughs> if you do papers like that, that would be great. I think we can have time for one more question. So, but uh, somewhat related. Yeah. Uh, when you are uh, using the PCA yeah. to decide the whether the country is more care friendly or not, or like, 
Um, education and health expenditures, right? Relative, Relative to income changes. And then you're compared to... Yeah. Countries. Of course. Which countries don't have that sort of relative? Yeah, okay. How about those are... Okay, proving your point, they are outlining the country, but there is another motive behind them, and that's not gender-friendly. But the model with this form does not speak into that, right? It, right, I mean, that's why it's called care-led. On the supply side, you have the gender inequality variables. On the demand side, it's just about investment. So you can have a care-led economy that's highly gender unequal, but invests a lot in care services. Uh, hello. Um, so at the end of your uh, presentation, you mentioned um, the capacity of feminist economics to contribute to economic policy. And uh, that made me think, historically, there's always a face of uh, like the ne neo-Keynesians with Walter Heller and the face of neoclassical with uh, Martin Feldstein. So it makes me think, uh, and my question to you is, are you hopeful for a face of feminist economics to commit to economic policy representing America in the future? Asking, like, do I, is there someone that would be associated with it if, yeah? To affect uh, feminist economic policy, it's important to be in the drama. Yeah. And so I wonder if you're hopeful for that sort of representation. Well, I actually, I feel like that it's happening as we speak in the sense that I feel like the Build Back Better, right, and the investments in, in care that were uh, embedded in that project were very much the result of the work of feminist economists advocating for that perspective. And, you know, uh, talking about the care economy, which I think even Biden did talk about, is a reflection of that impact. So I wouldn't, um, I mean, I have their people, so Heather Boucher, who, there are a number of feminist economists who are the, on the Council of Economic Advisors. She was a, an associate editor for feminist economics, and her, so she's very much affected by, right, feminist conversations or meetings like this one, you know, folks who are sitting in, students who are sitting in the audience today. So in that sense, I think feminist economics has had tremendous success, and the fact that unpaid, Care and care work is in the SDGs is also a reflection of uh, not only feminist economists and academic types, right, but NGOs and women's organizations and advocating for these issues and have had a real impact on policy. Well, thank you, and we now have a little break, but please a warm welcome. Or thank you, everyone. Please. It's time for the expert panel section of our workshop. And uh, I'm not going to talk too much. I'm Yavuz Yashar. I'm one of the faculty members in the department. And I would like to thank everyone for their contribution, making this happen. Uh, before, had, uh, before the workshop, we sent two questions to the uh, participants here in the panel. And one is more like politics question, the other is more policy question, the way we put it. Um, and I'm gonna read those questions and then we will have, go first start. round, huh? You can start. I can start, for, okay, I can start from here. <laughs> I think uh, if we talk like five to seven minutes for each of us, for each question, and then, uh, and then we can do the second round and the policy question. Let's begin with the politics question. In the broader sense of the terms social production, reproduction, and care, how would you position the relevance and importance for a democratic society and democracy itself? This site begins. 
I'm definitely not a political economy person, but I will try to answer this. Um, the way I see democracy, I mean, how do we define it? I think uh, the democracy is basically respecting human rights and respecting fundamental uh, rights. Um, and then also uh, making sure that men and women are equal, they have equal rights, and they have the right to choose, and they can choose and exercise their choices. If that's how we think of democracy, care is the integral part of it, right? Because then gender equality is a question, and then when gender equality is a question, then you bring care, right? Because we already talked throughout this day that how care, unpaid care burden is, uh, women takes the, I'm not burden, I want to use the word responsibility, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I definitely want to use the word responsibility. <laughs> unpaid care responsibility uh, is women actually uh, shoulder that kind of responsibility more uh, than men. So understanding how gender equality, I mean, what are the, what are the drivers of gender inequality is very important to understand, and definitely we talked about care, right? Care is definitely one of them. And then also thinking about how to invest uh, to kind of, I mean, what kind of investment we want to do and where to invest to make a gender equal society and we will have a multiplier impact. And that's again, care. Because when you invest in care, gender equality, it's like accelerating equality and thinking address, through it addressing care. Because when you invest in care, I always find it as a win, 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 win. It's a win for everybody. Because when you invest in care, uh, we can have women to participate in the labor market. We can have children to go to daycare center and can have human capital development. We can have impact on family members because family members also, like we know that because of this unpaid work, even we see siblings cannot go to school. Sometimes they are also constrained by this burden. Grandmothers are not burden, again, responsibility. Grandmothers are also taking care of the child. So that's again, and the last win is eco economic growth. We just heard that how this GDP increase is so important, and if that's the case, then um, this is the win-win-win-win for all of us, and gender equality connects so much with democracy and women can exercise their choices. When I say that women can go to the labor market and how, uh, how gender equality, like connecting to that, I always say that the goal is not to provide care provision, the goal is not that women, everybody will go to the labor market because there is a time squeeze issue that we also talked about. It's about the choices you are giving the women. Women can exercise their choices. If they want to stay at home, home and have more leisure time, that's their choice. If they want to provide care themselves, that's the choice. But you have to provide them with the choice, not constrain them in this, you know, that oh, you have to do care work because there is no other option available for you to uh, get it from the market or anywhere else. I also think this also impacts women from participating in the uh, as a lead in a leadership role, like in a political, like think about wh how many women leaders we know. And not even in the US, if you go around the world, we don't even see that many women leaders. So that's also in other aspects of, I guess, democracy or political system where women can participate in those forums, in those political uh, systems where they can put their words and they can exercise their choices. And when it comes to, I mean, you know, when in this care space, women are also, when you see like both the sides, women are also the most affected. So there is a recipient side and there is a provider side. And when I see the recipient side also, uh, aging is happening, elder care, we haven't talked about elder care a lot, but when aging, if you think about aging, then women are the most affected one. Firstly, they will live longer, so that's one thing. If they do not participate in the labor market, they don't have pension, they, they have less income to, to support themselves, so they are basically in poverty. And the third is women are the one who will be providing the care support. So they are also getting affected from the recipient end as well. Um, so overall, I think this is definitely an important topic. And any society to thrive, you cannot ignore care. This is essential. But then the question is who provides them, whether state takes the responsibility or uh, how, how do you bring this gender equality? And care is definitely an important one to bring the gender equality uh, forward. By the way, I wanted to mention that in the UN uh, now there is a, there is a um, kind of conversation going on to make care as human rights. So 
I think that's also very crucial because they are working towards it. We are all working towards it. So I think that's very, very important. I'll stop here and they'll just pass. Uh, before I answer the questions, I just want to take a second to introduce myself because there are a lot of faces in this room that I've never met before. My name is Katherine Rutschlin. I'm faculty at the University of Utah, and as part of my role there, I'm the director of our public policy analysis group, so the uh, faction of our department who believes in turning our work toward public purpose. We provide economic research for a lot of state agencies and federal agencies. So uh, we, we have worked and still continue to work with the Division on Services for People with Disabilities, the Office of Child Care, the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice, Veterans Affairs, et cetera. So my expertise on this panel, I would say there are a lot of people in this room with more expertise than me, but my expertise is really at the local level. And um, so I kind of want to answer this question in two parts, and I will do my best to incorporate everything that I learned from you today as you spoke. Um, I might stumble a little bit. Um, first, uh, at, at the University of Utah, as was pointedly mentioned during Yazga's presentation, Utah is a state with a pervasive legacy of gender essentialist and misogynistic attitudes. And those attitudes are internalized among the female population as well as the male population. And there's good evidence to back up that fact. Um, that has translated to real material destructive tendencies at the level of the well-being of women and the household. So in both the market realm and extra market realms, we see women with worse outcomes in Utah, and in fact, some of the worst outcomes in Utah on both sides of that story. So we have the biggest so-called childcare desert, the least access to childcare for the given population of children under five. We have the highest gender wage gap at 18, uh, sorry, 28%. Um, so, so a 28% gap between female and male wages. We have the lowest labor force participation among women in the United, in the United States at, I believe, 59%. Uh, and then in the non-market side, we have the lowest educational attainment of women, the worst health outcomes, and extraordinarily high rates of suicide and domestic abuse. So one part of answering this question, how serious, how critical is this discussion of social reproduction well, where I live, it's existential, right? It's really materially degrading the living standards of women and families. Um, but I appreciate this question in a broader sense because it did push me to think a little bit more deeply about how we categorize the multitude of crises that we face in the United States and around the world today. You know, I sort of started out with a benchmark of zero to climate change and where does social reproduction fall into that? But as um, Madison pointed out when she, with her great discussion of social reproduction uh, theory, um, it's really not appropriate to divorce the care work, social reproductive aspects of society from the ecological crises that we see today. Because both are aspects of seeing care work, ecology, and uh, our welfare of future generations as things that are trade-offs with the benefits that we can achieve through a robust economy that features growth, right? Um, so I appreciate this question for pushing me to think about that a little bit more deeply. And I would go back to the way the COVID crisis really laid bare how difficult it is to maintain social relations in the household and within communities and simultaneously maintain market relations. And I think that as we saw those fissures occur in society, and people became increasingly atomized, increasingly disconnected from their communities, I think that that created a great deal of democratic tension in society. And so I think that this really is a critical issue for today's kind of US problems as well. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Linda? So is it? Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, 
So I'd also like to introduce myself because you haven't um, seen me here yet. So I'm, also with, I'm with Daniel Grabner and we are coming from Austria. So today, um, and we are economic geographers. So what I would add, um, I was thinking because I'm not an expert as uh, many of you are um, on this topic, um, would be more of an abstract, um, what I have just um, read also and what I found interesting, but also maybe this uh, a little bit of geographic um, and just some debates that are maybe also interesting for you going on in Austria and going on uh, in Europe. So, um, yeah. So what I think, um, of course, it's very important and relevant. That's why we are all here, right? Um, so I'm not going into detail um, for this one, but there have been a lot of things that are already very important that you have mentioned. Um, what also, so I would start uh, by saying kind of, so this effective and inclusive care also requires like this collective um, social infrastructure that is then the question how to be funded, right? So there is a lot of uh, debate also going on um, which needs a progressive uh, tax system and how this should be implemented. Um, so do we take tax from the rich, do we, and I mean, the debate in Europe is very different than in the US, but in Austria, for example, there's no inheritance tax. So you have the richest people um, dying, sadly, but then their children just inherit all of their money and the state doesn't see anything of it, right? So there is so much um, loss of the, of the tax potential that would, that would be very well um, going into the social reproduction and the care. And um, yeah, so Emma Dowling, she wrote a lot on this as well. Um, and that's basically where I'm taking this from, but it's very important um, also in, in, in the European context. And then what I also found interesting was um, that maybe if we think about, so I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Austrian welfare system, but it's basically established, uh, it has been established since the, um, after the Second World War, and then you had this huge welfare state financing everything, right? So building houses, building um, everything, schooling is for free. Um, so that's basically um, the context of Austria. Um, and even there you see this uh, lack of political participation after this welfare um, of after these uh, welfare states, basically, um, where the general population, and I'm taking this from Peter Beresford, um, who says that the general population um, has become like, has or has moved into this passive role as uh, recipients of the state, um, of assistance that the state gives, distributes, redistributes to the people. Um, and then this in the real sense, uh, loses its ownership, right? So, um, and the active involvement in this participatory uh, con uh, democratic process, which that would be my point in um, for on this democratic debate, uh, because it's also what what the discourse now is, and I believe in the United States probably more than even in Europe, but in Europe it's also very bad with the uh, right wing populists and everything that um, you shouldn't, like, if you take a child, if you get money for your children, if you get like this, these, um, um, yeah, if you just get these monies from the state that are financed by taxes, then you're basically, you're receiving like welfare from the state, which should not be framed this way, right? Because as we know, all of this social reproduction and care behind it, and just, um, what has been like really two days ago is um, it's probably it probably hasn't been on the news in the U.S. or anywhere else, but in Austria it was very big that actually the Austrian chancellor, who is like uh, from the Conservative Party, he just said that um, why do poor people uh, or why do poor mothers um, actually he he's talking about them. Um, in um, in part-time jobs, why don't they feed their children properly? They could just buy like hamburgers from McDonald's, which is very um, a very weird thing to say because actually McDonald's has become very pricey in Austria as well. So that's just so such a such an interesting debate. And then say and then that said from the Chancellor of Austria says already a lot, right? Um, and then he also defended his uh, wording like, yeah, individuals should be, um, should be taken, like, 
um, should, should, be, should be responsible for themselves, for their children, their family, and so on. Which basically takes me to this other perspective of what Emma Darling also says, is that um, the individuals, we as individuals, have to take care of ourselves such that we don't become a burden of the welfare system, right? Which is also, again, this neoliberal shift um, to the individual um, and then taking away the responsibility of the public. Um, and then just one last thing I wanted to mention are local authorities um, where you have these. So if you come from really above and just look at the data, then it's usually hard to get these uh, territorial injustices or the cuts between uh, within regions or between regions. So there's also this growing dependence of citizen access to public services on the local tax base. So citizens basically are very dependent on whatever happens in their direct neighborhood. Um, and then this basically is also the point of um, social geographers who say that you should really also go there and look at um, like within inequalities. And um, yeah, I think that's the point I wanted to make. So I'm just passing it on. Um, he hello, uh, I'm Nathaniel Klein. I'm coming from uh, the University of Redlands. Um, though I'm returning to Denver, I was uh, a student here uh, as a master's uh, in the master's program, which I can't recommend highly enough. Um, which is why they saying that is why they let me be up here. Yeah. Um, no, I, let me join my co-panelists uh, in in um, qualifying my position on this panel. I, I am not uh, here as an expert. Um, my background is in uh, macroeconomics and economic history, and my foray uh, into the economics of care is relatively recent. Um, and so please understand that I'm speaking not as an expert, but as a person who is um, learning uh, quite a bit uh, about the uh, economics of care. Um, I thought it would be remiss of me to not mention, uh, if the question is about democracy uh, and democratic society, I thought it would be remiss to not mention that this is a, an auspicious day uh, to be talking about care uh, and democracy uh, because of the fundamentally undemocratic process that's going on right now uh, in our uh, Congress. Uh, we are facing, um, as I'm sure everybody in the room knows, a uh, looming child care cliff along with several other social support cliffs um, as, a, as a result of a fundamentally undemocratic process. Um, so that is the first thing that came to mind when I looked at the question. Um, the second thing I would, I would point out here is um, just in terms of the, the history uh, of, of this issue, um, you know, we, our, our paper is focused on the late 19th century and, and I think uh, one of the um, sort of astounding phenomenon uh, of the late 19th century is that it represents the period in which um, the, the roots of the modern US welfare state are constructed. And they are constructed, surprisingly enough, by disenfranchised people. Uh, it, the roots of the modern US welfare states, uh, I think, can be traced back um, to the mother's pensions that we mentioned earlier, which were uh, advocated for by a variety of women's groups and federations uh, around the country prior to uh, winning the right to vote. And so um, that clearly is a democratic act, but a democratic act by uh, disenfranchised people. Um, the, the thing that I, I, I'm sorry, I have scattered thoughts on this, so you'll have to forgive, forgive me. Uh, it's a big topic. Uh, the thing that I, I thought I would also mention um, is the complicated relationship uh, of care uh, to the democratic process so that um, you know, in, in the context of these, these mother, mother's pensions, um, we are talking about a, a policy uh, that asks women to, um, and, and demands of them in order to receive payment, that they remain in, in a so-called private sphere uh, and stay out of a public sphere. And so that in paying for care, uh, these states uh, were asking in return uh, for women to be excluded from um, in particular, poor women, uh, to be excluded uh, from public spaces. And so that's quite complicated, I mean, uh, in, in terms of a history. We have a, a sort of increase in the support of care, actually a valuing 
of care work, right? The federal government has put a, or the state governments have put a price on it, uh, while at the same time reducing the democratic participation of those who, who provide care. Um, so there's a, a really strange and complicated relationship between care in general and democracy. Um, I, I also wanted to point out, boy, this is random. Uh, I also wanted to point out um, just very quickly that we have mentioned often parents um, and I think if you ask about uh, democracy and democratic society, that uh, one of the things that first comes to mind is that in order to be a full participant of a democracy, you know, extending beyond voting, um, you know, we, I think we can all understand that, that uh, having safe, reliable care provisioning is essential to that. But I did also want to mention uh, that uh, we ought to think about the role of children uh, in a democratic society, uh, perhaps not just as future citizens, but as current. Uh, citizens uh, with rights and um, responsibilities of their own. Uh, and uh, so perhaps it is possible for us to talk about care, um, not just as investing in a future citizen, uh, and it's possible for us to talk about care, not just as allowing parents um, and, and mothers to uh, fully participate in democratic society, but also as um, ensuring uh, the well-being and protection of rights of, of children themselves. Um, the final and last completely random point that I will point out is that um, we can think of, of course, if we had a long conversation on democracy, of many sites of democracy, and one of those sites of democracy is in the household, one of those sites of democracy is in the voting booth, one of those sites of democracy is in the broader public sphere, and I would argue one of those sites of democracy is the workplace itself, and what I think is a, uh, maybe this is anticipating our next question, but what I think is an, a really encouraging development is the uh, unionization efforts among childcare workers, particularly in California, um, to gain uh, workplace democracy and workplace rights uh, that have been for so long denied to them. Um, so that um, democracy is not, or care work is not just essential for democracy, uh, I would argue democracy uh, in the workplace in particular is essential for the provision of care work itself. Thank you. <clears throat> well, um, I would like to thank, uh, thank you all. Uh, just want to add one more thing. And earlier when I was asking uh, a question about, you know, uh, our frameworks and how we think about this, somehow all those, you know, when you look at the international arena, all those dictatorial tendencies go hand in hand with the attacks on reproductive rights. Hungary, Poland, my own country, Turkey, those are the first come to my mind. And just recently, what happened in this country in the you know, constitutional fight over certain reproductive rights and the basic ones. Uh, to me, again, uh, there was a reason why we were asking this question. It, it, it's not far away. It's at the center of any democratic struggle and any democratic right. Um, the second part of our question is about the policy aspect. So I'm going to turn again to this side. And given your expertise at the local, international, uh, state level, whatever it is, we would like to know uh, what are the promising and not so promising policy aspects of uh, ongoing aspects of uh, promising aspects of the ongoing policy efforts in the US, Europe, and the rest of the world. Okay, um, whenever I'm asked this policy question, wherever I said, I, I want to begin it with uh, one size does not fit all. Um, that you have to remember when the policy questions comes up. Um, we are seeing a lot of differences across countries. So for me, I work, um, I work in the like uh, international, internationally I work with different countries and we, what we are seeing increasingly is like, even like how to support governments, what kind of policies to think about, it's not, it's, it's not, it, it, it changes from one country to the other. You have to, you have to think differently when you go from one country to the other. So I'll just add my recent experience in Gambia versus my recent experience in Indonesia. I work in both the countries and I went to Gambia to do this, uh, you know, very rapid assessment. It's a, it was a quality assessment and we went there. We wanted to understand 
because when, when we go into a country and when we go have that entry point, we have to think about the demand side, supply side, institutional side. So one of the also thing, the policies uh, where we struggle as well is who has the mandate from the government? So when we talk about the policies, it's, uh, and especially on childcare, like it can be Ministry of Health, uh, sorry, Ministry of Education, it can go to Ministry of Women, uh, Women's or Gender uh, in the country, or it can even, it's elder care, then it can, uh, care, then it can go to even Ministry of Health. So it, it, it is a struggle to first figure it out. But then when we went for this analysis from the demand and supply side, and we thought of like, what do you want? Um, they basically in Gambia, what we see is like they are so poor. They 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 needed to work outside, and the the dropout rates in the education is so high because they have early pregnancy. They are like, we want care, like uh, because we cannot afford to pay for it. We want universal. Um, care services or a child care center so that I can just send my kids and then I can go to work. And it was so, I mean, it, their demand is so high and they, they wanted care so much. They were saying that, you know, the preschool where the preschool centers are like only for four years old, where what they were telling us that the mothers basically go to preschools like where they have a, what, two years, two years old child and they're like, they beg them to keep the child so that they can do other work. So then they, for them, these policies of uh, free childcare provision, having accessibility becomes like so important. Whereas we went to Indonesia, it's a different context now, uh, where female labor force participation is already 50% around. The whole problem is it's stagnated, and the government is very serious about it. They want us to go in and help them to, to increase it. And we, we did the diagnostic again, the same demand and supply situation assessment, and the question when we asked, like, okay, I will provide you with a child care service, which is I'm going to set it up for you, and the government will come in. There will be a policy. Will you send your child to a child care center? How willing are you? And 80% said, we don't want to send my child to a child care center. And that point, you know the norms are binding. So what I want to mean is that this, the, the country, there are differences. Norms can be binding. There is a recent study was done in Egypt, and we have seen that they have provided subsidized child care services, actually child care subsidy they provided, and they still couldn't increase female labor force participation, and they concluded that the norms were binding. So they did not want to send, or they did not want to use that subsidy, or, or, or it did not have an impact. And when they were asked, like, why did not you use that, or why did not you send your child to a child care center? They said, I want also, I want a job, or why didn't you go to the labor market? They said, I want a job where they need, they have to have a flexible, uh, flexible work arrangement, or I want a job where they must have a paid family leave policies, or have leave policies where they pay me, because if my child is sick, how am I going to go to the work, uh, leaving my child. So, you know, the policies are also complementary. It, it, it is, even though you can have policies of universal child care, it may not even work in that country because of the mothers are thinking of that, okay, I'll go to the labor market. I'm, I don't have opportunities either. But if I do have opportunities, I need opportunities where we need flexible work arrangement policies. I need uh, policies for uh, child, I, I need policies for, you know, um, family leave policies. So th those are important. But however, like from my like experience so far, we have seen that um, parental, I mean, family leave policies is definitely is useful. Flexible, uh, I mean, flexibility in the workplace is definitely something that's pretty, pretty crucial. Um, parental leave policies, when we say about, I, I always say this, and I, it may be not a popular opinion, but I think policies also should be gender neutral because we're talking about redistribution somewhere. So parental leave rather than uh, parental leave also shows in literature that it has some redistributional impact, so that might be uh, very useful. However, when we see about policies, we also have to keep in mind that these policies that I'm, like right now we're talking about parental leave, those are for formal sectors. There are many, many any economy where you have informal sector, especially in Africa, 90% is in informal sector, then these parental leave policies or flexible work policies really does not come into like um, any, uh, does not work. So then you have to think about social protection, like how we can uh, think innovatively. There is some models called Kidogo models and things like that where, where you can go into this informal market and can provide childcare. So, I mean, there are a variety of policies and there are a variety of entry points. It can be community-based, it can be globally, like, you, you know, labor market policies. 
but then context matters. Uh, in some countries where it's working, in some countries others are not working. So we have to understand the context, the institutional framework, the demand and supply situation, and then think about where the entry point is and um, go ahead with the policies. Okay, I, I want to point to a few areas of optimism without necessarily focusing on how they will be ultimately disappointing. Um, <laughs> but I, I feel like they are, uh, the, that, that there are two sides to each of my examples. So I just want to run through a few, a few related uh, policy developments. First off, I think to the extent that uh, social reproduction is related to low wage labor, um, the movements among workers in low and middle wage jobs to really seize the opportunities presented by a tight labor market and advocate for better working conditions, including greater flexibility and a reduction in temporary employment especially, um, really bodes well for the ability to recognize social reproduction and care work in the labor market. Um, however, uh, of course, a tight labor market is a historically rare circumstance. So this is what we're really seeing is a window of opportunity where gains will be made and hopefully staked out in a way that's lasting. Um, but as the economy moves toward uh, higher levels of unemployment, purposefully, um, as, as a result of central bank policy, we'll see that bargaining power slip away. And I think that's a really important consideration uh, for us to, to um, do what we can to advocate for and promote that low wage worker movement. Um, secondly, uh, in, the, in the same vein, um, the FTC, the agency charged with managing workable competition in the United States, uh, has taken a really aggressive policy on uh, worker bargaining power and, and the um, monopsony power in labor markets. And that's something really new. Um, the FTC has determined that the labor market is within their purview and is starting to investigate a path forward for ensuring that workers have equal footing in wage labor negotiations. And I think that that is a positive development. Of course, that depends on the head of the FTC. Right now, that's Lena Kahn, um, appointed by the Biden administration. And so this adds extra weight to the upcoming election in terms of who will be in charge of that agency for that light of policy optimism to be maintained. Um, and then the third area I would point to is the state experimentation with increasing subsidies to both households, businesses, and workers using their COVID relief funding. Uh, every state received blocks of funding from the federal government, and each state used them in different ways, some quite creatively, some in ways that supported households directly to maintain the care labor that was ongoing throughout the pandemic, and some in ways that supported workers in those industries. So in Utah, for example, the uh, subsidies that were awarded to child care providers had a provision that those providers had to pay a wage of at least $15 an hour. So the average wage at their um, business organization had to be at a $15 an hour standard. So they managed to hinge those broader subsidy programs to improving the well-being of workers. And I think with the experimentation that occurred throughout that period, we'll be able to look and compare and see where those interventions were effective. Of course, they were incomplete. Of course, they left people out, people in the informal sector, for example. And of course, they face a cliff that's upcoming as COVID funding runs out in every single state over the next six to 12 months. Um, but I think that that it could be viewed as an opportunity to really acknowledge the importance of subsidies in the child care industry in, per, in particular. Um, and then uh, I want to point to a what I see as a really successful trend in policymaking that stemmed from the Black Lives Matter movement, which is the ability for black and brown communities in particular to develop leadership and political engagement at the level of their communities. So we have a lot of examples over the last five years or so of community organizations that invested in developing leaders 
in uh, promoting policies that they cared about and in establishing at the community level a means of co-governance between community members. One example of this is the Texas Opportunity Project, an organization that um, after Hurricane Harvey in, uh, in Texas organized among black and Latino constituencies to advocate for um, appropriate you know, accommodations to, to recover from that natural disaster to, and to ensure that budgets were spent equitably and responsibly. And I think that that community-based equity framework can be a really important part of policy making at this, uh, in, in these issues. Um, one thing that I want to point to on the less optimistic side is the sort of business and media attitudes toward the issues that arose and the change in worker attitudes over COVID. So the business view of care responsibilities as a labor cost. It's nice that they acknowledge that care work is necessary for them to continue accumulating capital. However, once care work's viewed as a labor cost, it's only more incentive to uh, deteriorate those standard employment contracts, move toward a pure wage labor relationship that maybe relies more on contingent and non-standard employment relationships. And the business media, and I would point to the Wall Street Journal and their ongoing coverage of TikTok for an example of this, has really pounced on these issues in a way uh, by highlighting you know, supposed trends like quiet quitting or lazy girl jobs, if many of you probably have heard those terms before, which really suggest that uh, workers are willing to be increasingly alienated at work as long as you give them balance in their lives, right? As if their working lives are not their lives. And so uh, the, the sort of media attention around the real sea change in the public attitudes toward, um, toward how we work and how work fits into our lives and our relationships, I think has been uh, overall uh, something that needs a strong, um, communication uh, in opposition, maybe from people in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so when, when I was thinking about this question, promising, um, and it was actually, so Daniel and I, we had a discussion about it, and it was not very easy to find promising points, um, especially for Europe, what we have seen. Um, but what we wanted, to, so there is one line of thought that I wanted to kind of share with you. Um, so one, and also maybe which came out of COVID and after COVID and um, in between also, is this increasing um, acknowledgement and public awareness of social reproduction workers, which has not been there um, before that, right? Um, and their essential role, and then they became um, suddenly system re relevant also in the, in the medial um, discourse. And, um, and everyone agreed, and, and then they, they clapped out of the window, which is um, nice and friendly, but it doesn't really help them, right? Um, help the, the social reproduction workers. Um, and also, what, and then there is a parallel between uh, the crisis before that. So we had the financial crisis, world financial crisis, and then it was like, whose system relevant? Well, it's the bankiers and it's the banks and uh, we need to save them, right? So we just uh, put all the money we have into them and then we save them, so they are system relevant. Kind of weird, but um, now it, we really have this group of system rele uh, relevant workers. Um, and this might or hopefully will um, increase or already has um, increase the pressure on the policymakers to, to fix this care crisis. So care crisis is um, very relevant right now, also in the um, um, so in the political sphere, but also in the in the media discourse. And a lot of um, people or a lot of researchers suggest this expansion of the care sector, right? And um, this is uh, it's very um, it's, just, it's very abstract, and uh, I'll just take it on the very easy um, point. Um, okay, expansion of the care sector, and then. Um, Catherine, I'm glad you mentioned it because then the climate crisis comes in, right? And it's, it's, uh, there is this argumentation of, okay, but do we really need expansion of any sector and what about uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, so what actually um, our colleagues at the department did and also at other universities um, in Austria um, was to um, create this APCC report for Austria. 
And there, there there's one strong argument for the expansion of um, the care sector, which is that the care economy is actually very climate friendly, right? So usually, depending on what uh, technology you use and depending on where the workers come from, it's actually, it's not like an industry, heavy metal industry or anything like that, but it's actually quite climate um, uh, neutral or climate friendly, which means that an expansion of the care um, economy is not that bad. It's actually really good also in the context of the climate crisis. So that's just a point I found very interesting and is um, maybe, uh, I don't know if it's already in, in, the, in the broader discourse, but um, that was quite interesting to see it also for Austria. Um, and then, of course, uh, there are a lot of not so promising points, and I'm not going to go into all of these, but what I think is um, quite important is that um, we also look we also need to look at policymakers, right? So what do they think of immediately when they hear the word care crisis? And I can tell you in most European or Western European and Northern European countries, it's like, oh, we'll just get um, migrant workers and then they'll do this stuff, right? And we can even pay them less, so that's good for us. Um, but really, we have to think about this um, global care chains, right? So what it is doing to when we are importing all of the um, all of the nurses and all of the elder care um, workers from uh, Southeast Asia or from other parts of the world. So I think that's very important because it's a it's an ongoing debate in Austria as well um, and in many other and in Austria it's not even worse in Belgium for example you have like nurses working eight um, eight night shifts in a row and stuff like so stuff like this um, it's very common there. Um, and then I wanted to add um, a third point, um, which is kind of ambivalent, um, and I would label, or we would label it as an interesting development, is, um, and you already talked about the increased labor union, uh, you did, um, and um, so this is also that uh, in Austria we've been seeing increased strikes, for example, in the healthcare sector, which has not been the case before that, because there was no basically no need for that before it, um, so the Austrian healthcare system used to be quite, um, yeah, I don't know, well established or I don't know. Um, and then, uh, but the ambivalent point is now that healthcare workers, they, they, they have, it's very hard for them to strike, right? So if you are in a firm, um, then you strike and which means that there is less output, less productivity, who cares? But then if in the health sector, um, people strike at workers, they, and we have heard it from um, also childcare workers, if they strike, then, then there are people on the other receiving end who don't get the care they would need. And so on the one hand, um, there are people who could die potentially because of strikes, but then also there are already people dying because of the current um, and unsustainable situation that the healthcare crisis and the, the care crisis is facing. So that was just what um, we wanted to add. Thank you. Um, well, I, I have uh, so little to add um, to, to what's already been said. In particular, my comments were um, going to be focused on the U.S. case, and um, I think Catherine has um, eloquently and exhaustively <laughs> covered many of the things that no, no. I mean, <laughs> you did it much better than I ever could. And so I, the only thing I would add are a couple small um, small notes and then one sort of large note where I, I retreat to familiar ground for me of, of, of macroeconomics. Um, one s sort of small note is that uh, in terms of this, the state experimentation already mentioned, um, I just wanted to add that um, there has been pretty significant expansion of pre-K uh, programs. Um, and um, so that, that is moving in the sort of opposite direction of the, you know, the child care cliff that we're facing, and um, in particular in California. One of the challenges, though, is actually staffing these pro training and staffing these programs. And um, so I think that'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that resolves itself. Um, I, I guess the, the thing that I wanted to mention that I thought of as a positive development uh, was more from a macroeconomic perspective. Um, you know, I, I am obviously uh, also concerned that we have a Federal Reserve that, that thinks um, uh, weakening the labor market is the path toward a lower inflation, um, which has 
I think clearly now been demonstrated was not necessary. But, um, but I think more importantly, if we look at the response to COVID in general, uh, in comparison, for instance, to the policy response of 2008, um, I mean, I don't know that we have any better evidence of the effectiveness of fiscal policy, the irrelevance um, of uh, the sort of traditional uh, cries uh, for austerity based on um, deficits. Uh, and so I think that the policy success of COVID is something, um, uh, it, from a macroeconomic perspective, uh, is something that, that is, is really encouraging and we can point to. I mean, we certainly didn't lose a decade the way we did after 2008. Um, the, the concern here, uh, of course, is that, um, that we are now in the face of a, of a budget shutdown and perhaps we are entering uh, an era uh, uh, going forward of, of, austere, of a return of austerity. Um, but, but at least we can point to uh, clear evidence of the success of large-scale fiscal policy, and in particular, large-scale fiscal policy that supported the care sector. Um, and uh, I, I think we know uh, from the literature that the care sector in particular is uh, one of the most uh, exposed and sensitive to the business cycle. Um, child care uh, centers in particular uh, seem to close uh, at dramatic rates uh, in, in um, business cycle downturns. And so we, we avoided a lot of that. Um, the, the other concern here, I think, is just that, um, as everybody worries about, the Biden administration has not seemed to have had success in communicating um, this, uh, this, this massive policy success as a policy success. And so I don't know what that means going forward. I'm not a politician, but that's where I would be a little bit nervous. The last and final thing that I would mention is that um, a number of outlets, uh, and this one I'm a little bit ambivalent on, a number of outlets, um, uh, including you know papers like The Economist, Wall Street Journal, and others, uh, have e expressed um, a great deal of concern over uh, the demographic transition in the United States, in particular, right, that, that folks are, are not having children. And one version of that conversation is that the reason folks are not having children is because uh, we don't have the care uh, infrastructure in place to support them, and that it is um, really hard to, to be a parent right now, and in particular with degrees of, of inequality. The, the part where I'm a little bit concerned is the flip side of that conversation, uh, in which uh, the those on the nativist right, um, those on the, the, the racist right, are, are concerned that this is a, um, uh, a problem of, of whiteness uh, and, and the dominance of, of white families in the United States. And so I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent on this, but this perhaps is one route uh, in which um, you know, an, uh, an argument could be made that if you are concerned about uh, demographic problems, that perhaps one solution is um, uh, further care support, uh, but again, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that as a political strategy. Thank you. That's it. Well, just uh, dovetailing that is um, 1994, I believe it was the World Bank report first uh, problematizing the, you know, fertility crisis in the West and uh, longevity, and as a result, we have to reform our social security system. Uh, it was not phrased that way, but right now we are phrasing from the care terms or social reproduction terms, it, and it makes more sense. The re there is a reason why we have that crisis. You know, uh, Part of the reason is people don't have care, and then there is a fertility aspect of it. And then supporting your argument, it, it was the Hamilton project, I believe. They, one by one, item by item, they calculated the multipliers for the uh, after the Great Recession, uh, all the fiscal measures and uh, their impact. How tax cuts, for example, did not make a big dent as much as uh, helping with the care services or things like that. So uh, I believe uh, we have a few more minutes. Would you like to add anything or ask anything? Experts are here. Robert, do you want to say something? Is this on? Yeah. Good. Um, I just wanted to um, take up something that 
Nate said in his first statement, which I thought was really, really important, which was about children and children as citizens of a democracy. And I think um, a part of that is, that, I mean, th that has a lot to do with care, right? The children have to be given the ability to be, prob to be citizens, but to be citizens in their own right as children, right? I mean, what do, what the, but what do children, well, uh, Nate may question this somewhat, but what do children give us? They give imagination, they give affection, and they give silliness. And silliness is one of the absolutely most important things in the world. But, and Nate began talking about that as well later, the, the reactionaries want to suppress children. The parents' rights movement is the right to own their children as private property. And, you know, I don't know if you saw, but there's this awful thing. I mean, yet another scandal of an evangelical Christian with this show about her wonderful family. She was torturing them. She was starving them. Okay? Okay. Uh, my name's Sydney Mock. I'm a recent graduate of the MA program here. Um, and throughout my time at DU, I was also working at the child care center that's associated with the university. Um, so I just am really enjoying sitting here and watching my two worlds collide today and really thank all of you for being here and presenting all of that. Um, that being said, this morning, um, throughout the paper talks, this qualitative methods conversation kind of kept surfacing itself um, around kind of showing that qualitative methods haven't always been utilized uh, in the economic field. And I was wondering if anyone who wanted to on the panel could reflect on the value add or the importance of including some sort of qualitative piece in research, especially how it relates to informing policy decisions. Yeah, I can. I can think about it because I always do qual and quant both, uh, even though I'm an economist. I think, I mean, I, I always felt I'm an economist. I have bias towards quant, quantitative data. It's always the bias. But I always felt it's very important to also do qual because that gives you perspective. Um, for quantitative studies, we need quantitative numbers because, again, when we go with the governments and we talk with the governments, they want return on investment. You have to talk about what's the return in numbers, um, and and then we need to quantify stuff. So quant quantitative studies is very important too. But we also do qual. Uh, because so for instance, let me give you the example of Indonesia. We have done diagnostic in quantitative ways so that to measure demand of childcare, right? We asked all these quantitative questions, had a survey set up nationally representative, but we also went there with qualitative questions where in the quantitative surveys, we cannot expand a lot. So for instance, there was more open-ended question on, hey, to the childcare providers, what kind of challenges were you, uh, were you facing? Uh, to the mothers, we did a focus group discussion asking them what it looks like, like what do you want? But we elaborated those answers. We kind of tried to get the context out of it and how they are thinking, what they are thinking, which sometimes we cannot do with the quantitative. Quantitative is very limited to this closed-ended questions. You have certain options, and they tick the options, and we don't see what, what's happening uh, behind. So uh, we use both the, both the narratives. We have quant, and, and, the, and the, the way the diagnostic report is coming through is we have the quant studies, but when we have the quant studies, we are supporting it through the qual qualitative studies, where we are saying that we are also seeing the similar pattern in the qualitative, but then you can cite somebody saying something, and it makes it more real for people to understand what's going on. Um, the same with the Gambia studies, the example I have given that they begged to go to the um, preschools and saying that, please keep my child two years old. You may not find that in the quantitative study. You get this narrative from the qualitative studies, and you, you kind of combine both. And I'm supporters of mixed methods more than uh, one or the other. I think uh, Professor Bronstein made a pretty good case for economics as rhetoric in her presentation. And of course, uh, there are lots of different 
forums for that rhetoric to be powerful. And I think quantitative rhetoric has a lot of power in the spaces where funding is allocated, um, not just at the government level, but also among foundations, right? They wanna see documented uh, uh, improvements or effects of the things that they're funding. Um, at the same time, I think there are really important spaces where qualitative information is powerful and specifically because it provides the contextualization for those, for those quantitative um, results. And I think as a rhetorical tool, you're not really telling the full story unless you have all of it. Um, but I, I want to kind of take a left turn um, from that and also say, you know, of, of all of the, you know, dismal science, you know, uh, depressing things I brought up, the, the, the area that I've actually found the most hope for progress um, in in care and ecosystems and resource maintenance and the future of society has been in the arts and humanities and in particular in literature where the ability to envision dynamic systematic change has um, been frequently, increasingly frequently targeted toward these crises. And I think that as economists, you know, we privilege our qualitative and quantitative methods, but that there's a lot to be learned from uh, other disciplines that we can pull in, and in particular, the arts and humanities. So thank you all. Uh, despite all our differences, the last message is organize. <laughs> Thank you. Let's take have a break. This summer of 2023, um, many have called the summer of feminine joy because, you know, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Barbie, uh, women have been sharing spaces uh, with each other and filling male-dominated spaces, such as football fields, um, with this feminine joy and embracing the power of women. Um, in fact, some have actually credited Swift and Beyonce and Barbie for saving the economy. Uh, I believe uh, that the Fed wrote a paper on the economic impact of Taylor Swift. Uh, and for those of you who didn't watch football before, um, Taylor's made the NFL relevant again. Um, <laughs> by the way, the Chiefs are playing the Broncos next week, and so just in case, Broncos suck too, so you might be able to get cheaper tickets than the jet tickets. Um, so yeah, women are having a moment. Uh, and I've been thinking about this day throughout the summer um, and the feminine joy that I thought I would bring because we'd be coming together to talk about social reproduction and caring. And uh, with that, it is uh, my pleasure and joy to introduce uh, our last speaker, Nancy Fulbright. Um, Nancy Fulbright is Professor Emerita of Economics at the University of Mass Massachusetts Amherst. Her research explores the interface between political economy and feminist theory with a particular emphasis on the value of unpaid care work. She has written many articles and books, most recently The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems and Intersectional Political Economy. Great read if you haven't looked at it. Um, uh, for Love and Money, uh, was the editor on. Uh, a personal favorite of mine was The Invisible Heart. That's how I was introduced to Nancy's work early on. Um, she, although retired, she's still actively writing and researching and supporting other researchers uh, and has a great blog on uh, care work and feminist theory called Care Talk. Um, so in care and feminist economic theory, I would offer that Dr. Fulbright um, has provided the same inspiration, joy, and hope as an influencer like uh, that of Taylor Beyonce Barbie, but <laughs> in the realm of economics. So I truly am that excited to have both Alyssa, uh, a student of Nancy and Nancy here today. Um, and one last popular culture reference, uh, Nancy's talk today is titled Accounting for Care, Adventures in Measurement Evaluation. And I was like, man, if that does not sound like powerful girl math, I don't know what is. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm uh, super happy to be here. I feel like uh, the kinship of heterodox economists and their commitment to issues like this is our greatest strength. And uh, I've really learned a lot today, and I'm really hoping we can have a, a, a good discussion to, to, to kind of get closure on everything that has transpired today. So I'm just going to try and keep my comments really brief so that we can um, have this be 
uh, a more informal exchange. So I'm going to uh, just talk about three things. I'm going to talk about a, a definition of care provision that's bigger, I think, more expansive than, um, or at least more kind of specifically expansive than uh, what we've been talking about today. And then I'm going to uh, explain why I think this definition of care provision is relevant to understanding the trajectory of efforts to understand the devaluation of unpaid work and uh, efforts to remedy that. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, undervaluation of paid care work, which I think uh, derives from, from some very sort of similar uh, um, characteristics. And I think, you know, part of the aim here is to try to develop a theory that is effective in building a, a very large coalition of people who will support the idea of uh, uh, valuing and investing in care provision uh, more generously than we have. So I'm going to give you a long list of characteristics of care provision, but I just want to foreshadow that the one that I think is the most important one is that care has many characteristics of a public good. It creates benefits that are non-rival and non-excludable, that last for generations, and that have a kind of multiplier effect. And that is what makes care provision um, kind of similar to what we think of as environmental assets and ecological services on which we also depend. Um, and uh, which also have those characteristics. And I think that gives us some insights into the ways that we uh, are, are trying to figure out to develop accounting systems for uh, ha being able to more effectively monitor what's happening with our social and our, our physical environment. And the direction that I'm, I'm heading towards at the end is, is kind of an argument that uh, we don't have to get rid of gross domestic product, but we have to kind of reverse our polarities and see gross domestic product as an input into human capabilities instead of the other way around. And to that end, I'm going to be making a case for an accounting system that is not just based on prices and incomes, but which includes a lot of qualitative things like health, <laughs> education, health, w welfare, things in like similar to those in the sustainable um, development uh, indicators, and to use that dashboard to, to guide our, our kind of uh, our priorities in making social policy. So I, I define care provision, and by the way, I like to talk about care provision, not just care work, because I think money is also a really important input into care, and this is a reason why we can't just stop thinking about GDP. It has to be also kind of included in our uh, accounting system. But um, I define care provision as the production, the development, and the maintenance of human capabilities. So I'm using a broader term um, than Alyssa, who referred to human capacities, and it's building to some extent on Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum's work, but it's more economic in its orientation and less philosophical. And to tell you the truth, I don't actually use the word exactly the way Sen and Nussbaum do. I'm trying to use it to encompass both the human capacities that Alyssa referred to, that is, things that improve productive capabilities, productive capacities, um, and also an intrinsic value, and that the intrinsic value of capabilities has to be part of, of that equation, and that is something that can't be measured with that money metric, which is why we need a more uh, expanded uh, system. So, defined in these terms, it's really big. It encompasses a lot of stuff. It includes inputs of time, inputs of money. It includes a lot of paid work. It includes a lot of unpaid work. It can be characterized in terms of specific occupations, as in the earlier discussion um, by Daniel and Linda of, 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 uh, of uh, occupational segregation and changes in that over time. But it also includes industries, and I'll make a case towards the end of my remarks about thinking about the industries of health, education, and social welfare as uh, care industries. It has direct dimensions, and the direct dimensions are more like face-to-face, hands-on, 
emotional connection, uh, concern for the well-being of the care recipient, and it has indirect aspects, which are um, tasks that are necessary for the fulfillment of those direct care activities. This is a distinction that kind of echoes uh, and builds on Minyan Duffy's distinction between um, nurturant and reproductive uh, labor. And I think I just want to emphasize those two things are very connected and they, are, they often go together. It's often really hard to separate them, so you can't really necessarily draw a line between direct and indirect, nurturant and reproductive. And in terms of time use surveys and unpaid work, this shows up when you think about housework as kind of indirect care and child care, elder care, tending to somebody who really needs uh, personal assistance is the nurturant or, or, or direct care thing. So I think reproductive as well as nurturant care um, is generally of higher quality when there's some concern for the well-being of the care recipient. I mean, you, you can have care services that don't include that, but really um, that uh, because it's often hard to directly observe or monitor the effectiveness of care work, a lot depends on the intrinsic motivation of the care provider. And in a way, you'll see where I'm going, maintaining and reinforcing and rewarding that intrinsic motivation has to be a part of uh, making, creating uh, a, a sustainable care economy. It also, care services also require a lot of teamwork. There are often multiple inputs. Parents are collaborating with teachers. Doctors are collaborating with patients. Teachers are collaborating with students. You can be a great teacher if your student isn't working with you and helping co-produce the learning process itself, it's not gonna work. And that uh, aspect of team production, I think, is really important to care services. Also, person-specific skills. That uh, uh, connection, face-to-face, hands-on, uh, you know, not transient, but rather ongoing relationship um, uh, is also really important to the quality of care services. And, um, That, and then the final thing, which I kind of foreshadowed, is that the consequences or the output of care provision is, is, is not just a transaction, it's not just a service that has its counterpart in the market, it's improvements or, or maintenance in or improvements of the human capabilities of, of the population as a whole, which has these uh, really important uh, public good effects. And this the whole process is taking place in a lot of different sites. It's taking place in households, it's taking place in the market, it's taking place through the state, and it's taking place through international transfers, including um, chain migration and, and care chains, as it were. So we have to take all those into account. So how does this relate to the, the framework of social reproduction? Well, I think it's, it, it fits very well with and parallels that conceptual framework, but it's a little bit different for the following reason. Uh, social reproduction, or the social reproduction literature, uh, at least historically, evolved kind of as an emphasis on the social reproduction of capitalism and the uh, you know, processes that were necessary to the functioning of capitalism as a mode of production. And I think that is an excessively narrow definition that, uh, in my view, patriarchal systems have played an important role and continue to play an important role in the organization of the economy. In some ways, patriarchal systems emerged as a solution to the problem of how you guarantee a large supply of care, basically making it very difficult for women to do anything else but provide care. And I think the interaction between capitalist and patriarchal and racist and nationalist uh, dynamics creates a more complicated picture than the uh, classical social reproduction frame. But I also think that a lot of research now taking place under that rubric acknowledges that and is moving in that direction. And I see some convergence between uh, these two lines of thought. I think it's a, it's a very fruitful kind of um, interaction of, of, uh, of different uh, concepts. So let me turn now to the valuation of unpaid work. And I think the history of efforts to measure and value unpaid work it is really interesting. It kind of speaks to this tension between the qualitative and the quantitative that's come up over and over again. Because what we see is that uh, 
instruments of quantification that were initially introduced in our societies, uh, are, we now recognize that they're fundamentally flawed. And we have this ongoing discussion and dialectic of trying to improve the way that our accounting systems are, 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 are working. And that results from uh, skepticism about empirical results and questioning of, of the epistemological frameworks that generate certain survey designs. So I think looking at the history of surveys, uh, uh, labor force surveys and time use surveys and national accounts gives us some really important lessons for thinking about the future. Not that we can ever arrive at a perfect accounting system, but it teaches us to be skeptical of the way accounting systems are set up. So one of my favorite uh, kind of stories about the um, uh, measurement and evaluation of unpaid work is that it, it came up very explicitly in 1878 when the Association for the Advancement of Women in Boston, Massachusetts wrote a letter of protest to the US Census saying, you know, we protest that, that women's domestic efforts are in no way counted as a contribution to the nation's wealth. And um, nobody paid very much attention. I mean, I, I actually discovered this letter in the, you know, in the very fine print of the index to a very obscure history uh, of the US Census. But when I found it, I got so, it, this is really the story of how I got involved in, in, um, in pursuing this line of work. And I, I can, could tell you um, at some point uh, when we had more time, I could tell you this really fascinating story of how the issue was just repressed and then it popped up again and then it got <laughs> pounded down again and then it popped up again and then it got pounded again and then it came up again. And gradually with, all the, with a cyclical process that really has uh, emerged in a really interesting way, largely as a result of mobilization by women's groups, international mobilization, pushing for changes in uh, survey methodology, the administration of time use surveys, and uh, modifications to the national income accounts. And I think you know some of you are probably um, familiar with some aspects of that, that story, but um, it's really a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating process, and it's far from over. So we have time use surveys that are giving us some really good data about how to measure unpaid work, but they don't really measure care responsibilities very well. They look primarily at activities of care. How much time did you spend feeding a child? How much time did you spend reading aloud to a child? How much, did you feed, how much time did you spend administering medication to an elderly family member? But a lot of the responsibilities of care have to do with availability, being on call, being present, in case direct care is needed. It's illegal in most states in the US to leave a child under the age of 13 unsupervised. And supervisory constraints are a much bigger uh, chunk, require a much bigger chunk of time than active care. And I've done a lot of empirical work on, on this particular topic, and I'm happy to um, tell you um, more about the details. But the, the you know, a similar process of ongoing contestation concerns the national income accounts. So for a long time, um, as Alyssa mentioned, it was unpaid work was just excluded from the accounts. And then with the development of time use surveys, it became harder to exclude them because, and here the, the rhetoric of economics, the quantification, right, it was kind of a powerful impetus. And so we, we saw, you know, basic efforts to to um, uh, figure out a way to impute a value to it. But, and you can look at the US satellite account. It's a huge achievement that we now have a measure of, you know, based on replacement costs, what it would cost to, you know, if all of the people engaging in unpaid work basically stopped doing that work, what would it cost us uh, to, to replace that work? But <laughs> that's good, right? But it's, it's, sort, it's really, ba the imputations for that satellite account are based on the wages of a domestic servant. It's an estimate of replacement cost that assumes that all that's getting done in households is something that's uh, comparable to the uh, you know, impersonal work of a group of people who are historically very disempowered by their gender, their race, and their immigration status. And it's, uh, I've always been torn, I mean, you know, I've actually put a lot of effort into constructing replacement cost estimates. I've, I've tried to um, 
I've, I have always used more generous assumptions than those used in the current uh, satellite account. But the more I have worked in this literature, the more I'm persuaded that replacement cost itself is really misleading. What we really need to do is look at the, the output, the value created by unpaid work. And to do that, we need more sophisticated analysis of the relationship between care provision and, and social indicators like mental health, community health, uh, educational attainment, uh, drug abuse, whatever. We need a whole, we need much, a much more expansive picture of social costs and social goods on both the individual and the community level in order to really come to a better understanding of how unpaid care and paid care and money combine uh, to create uh, the outcomes that we care most about and the outcomes that are really necessary to our future, right? So I think that what this approach does is it really dethrones the idea of market valuation as the, the, the primary form of valuation. Um, and this makes sense because future, our future generations can't participate in the market. They don't have any voice in the market, nor do they have any voice in the polity. If we want an accounting system that's relevant to their well-being, we need to just completely depart from uh, reliance on that uh, standard uh, GDP metric. So um, this brings me to the third point, which is looking at care penalties in paid work. And, t and I, th I, th I think some of the similarities, some of the reasons for the undervaluation of paid care work um, are, are pretty obvious and pretty similar uh, to what we've all been talking about. It's mostly women that do it, that are in these jobs. They're uh, disproportionately people of color. Immigrants are very heavily uh, represented. Uh, many of them with credentials that aren't recognized in the US that don't enable them to get the professional uh, recognition uh, that they deserve. But I think an the, 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 the underappreciated factor is that a lot of paid care workers are creating public goods. They're creating the value of what they produce is not captured by the institutions they work for. So teachers, what teachers are paid has nothing to do with their quote unquote marginal product, right? Uh, I mean, nothing. I mean, there's no way you can really measure it. You can try to by looking at changes in standardized test scores, right? But the actual, what we think of as the actual benefit that a teacher creates in conjunction with other care providers at the same time is something that is uh, both difficult to measure and very difficult to, you know, to capture. The same thing is true for nurses. Um, you know, in hospitals, most hospitals bill for nursing the same way they bill, bill for a room. It's a fixed cost. You know, it's, it's not based on hours or expertise or skill. It's just like nursing care. It's just a, uh, you know, it's just a service and, 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 and that it's, that's, that's how it's billed. And um, if you think about your own experience looking at, at the pay scales that, that you're familiar with, you've probably noticed that English professors get paid a lot less than sociologists and sociologists get paid a lot less than economists, and economists get paid a lot less than professors, full-time professors in a business school. So why is that? Is it because business school professors are more skilled? Is it because they're more productive? Or is it because they produce something that's more easily measured and more easily captured by those that employ them? You know, just the difference between a business school, think about the difference between a business school and the economist is thinking about growth, social welfare, kind of things that are, 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 are just uh, almost by definition re more related to the public good than, than to some individual uh, rate of return. And I think this is also true for parents. What are parents doing when they raise kids? Uh, they're creating uh, uh, a set of capabilities you know, by caring for children, they're raising children who will in turn be likely to care for others in a multiplier effect that goes through generations. So you can't, you can't measure the value added uh, of a parent in terms of some net discounted flow of future earnings, right? Uh, and I think this, this, is what, this, I think, is a really powerful analogy. I'll, I'll, give you a couple, I'll give you one more example that I think is really good. We think of doctors as a relatively privileged 
occupation and the labor force. And in fact, some doctors are extremely well paid. They're really in the, in the, in the top 1%. But it's also true that doctors are engaged in the process of producing health, and they're not paid on the basis of per unit improvements in health, except in some cases. And if you look at variation in the earnings of doctors, you see a really interesting pattern. Guess what the most highly paid specialty, physician specialty is in the US? Cosmetic surgery. Not just plastic surgery, which involves repair of injuries and uh, disabilities, but cosmetic surgery, which is largely a private pay practice, not, not restricted by insurance, uh, for which affluent consumers are the primary uh, customers, um, and where it's pretty easy to see the results. Do I look better or you know, do I look worse, right? So the second highest specialty in, in, among US physicians is orthopedic surgery. Well, what is it about orthopedic surgery? Well, you, it's, pretty, it's pretty mechanical. You, you know, it's broken, you fix it, the, the hip is worn out, you replace it. It's pretty easy to judge the success or failure of, of uh, surgeries of that type. And you don't really need to have a close personal relationship with your orthopedic surgeon. Believe me, I, I've had experience with orthopedic surgeons <laughs> a lot. And uh, I'm perfectly happy with saying hello, goodbye. Uh, but uh, doctors that are providing family care are way, way, way down on the pay scale. And that's because, you know, if you're providing family care, how do you measure your impact? How do, how do, your, how do your, uh, your patients assess your skill? It's really hard. And in fact, you know, the benefits of getting good care, good primary care from a family health care provider um, might not be realized for, for decades, right? So there's also kind of a time frame. Okay, so guess who's at the very bottom of the, of the pay scale for fifth physician specialties in the U.S.? Pediatricians are close to the bottom, but public health. Public health. Public health. Think about that. During COVID, all the people that were, were basically tasked with the job of understanding how to fight, you know, how to fight a really dangerous and contagious virus are in a, a subspecialty of medicine that's always been poorly paid because nobody wants to pay for it. And nobody wants to pay for it because the benefits are very diffuse, very non-rival, and very non-excludable in, in consumption. So I think that's, those are some anecdotal reasons to think about this, this public good issue uh, as one that's really relevant to care. But I've also done a lot of empirical work with co-authors exploring this topic. And we've done a pretty detailed analysis of data from the um, current population survey looking at uh, the earnings of employees in health, education, and uh, social services relative to employees in business services. And we make that comparison because these workers are very, very similar in terms of their educational attainment, their hours of work, and also uh, their race. And they're not terribly different in terms of their, uh, of their uh, gender differences. So uh, the really interesting finding is not just that nurses and teachers who we think of as care workers earn less than their counterparts, or that you know, child care workers and elder care workers who are at the very bottom of the occupational hierarchy are, earn way less. But in general, even professionals and managers in care industries earn a lot less than their counterparts. And I think a big part of the reason is that in business services, it's much easier to see what the contribution of an individual worker is to the firm's revenue and to make an assessment about uh, to what extent that worker is contributing to the profitability of the firm. And that's really not true in education and healthcare and social services. So given, and this paper was published recently in the um, ILR Review, which is a pretty good labor economics journal. And if you're interested in the details, you can look at it there. But we also pursued some kind of case studies and one case study had to do with an environmental engineer from the Midwest who called us up and said, I think environmental engineers suffer a care penalty. And I was, we just were fascinated by this discussion with this really 
uh, uh, engineering professor who had been trying to recruit more women into environmental engineer, into engineering into the engineering program, and he noticed that a uh, the one specialty that women were drawn to and were really overrepresented in was environmental engineering, and he also was pretty sure he thought that the pay in environmental engineering was a lot lower than the pay in computer engineering or electrical engineering. So really interesting because the cr educational credential is exactly the same um, across some of these specialties. So we went in and found a really good data set uh, for the pay of engineers and, really, and showed that environmental engineers, even controlling for gender, you know, being a woman in environmental engineer, you earn less, but even if you're not a woman, you earn less if you're an environmental engineer than in a, an engineering specialty where it's really easy to capture the results of what you provide. And then we also did, um, we got involved in a project looking at earnings of uh, social workers in Seattle, Washing Seattle, Washington. And we were really struck with how low the pay of social workers was. And we, it occurred to us that not only are they care workers, but they're caring for the most disadvantaged, powerless, and generally despised subsections of the of the U.S. population. And we thought, you know, wow, that is that could that is that isn't doesn't that contribute to their bar economic bargaining power? That that even uh, taxpayers are are less motivated or interested in supporting social work than things that offer their people who look like them and walk and talk like them. Uh, the benefits, and in fact, we did find some very good, very robust empirical results that social workers uh, are are paid significantly less than workers with similar education and training. And this is even compared to workers in health and education. That is, even compared to other employed care workers, uh, they're paid less. So, um, so again, I think what's interesting about this this finding. I mean, it's interesting in and of itself in terms of thinking about earnings and I think, uh, interesting in th terms of thinking about divisions in the labor force um, between care workers and others. But it's also interesting because it, I think it helps undermine the market metric, the notion that people are paid according to what they produce. And it suggests that people are paid maybe partly according to what they produce, but largely according to how much bargaining power they have. And their bargaining power is affected by a lot of things: their their race, their gender, their citizenship, the mar maybe the market power of their employer, so forth and so on. But it is also influenced by the particular characteristics of a service that has has public uh, uh, rather than offers really big public rather than private returns. So. I don't know. I'm going to stop there, just except just to say that I think it's. I think it's just all part of this process of trying to dethrone gross domestic product, which is basically the value of goods and services that are bought and sold, and to say this is but a tiny aspect of the value that we are, we are creating. And we can't and we, we don't purport to provide an exact measure of its dollar, the dollar value of, of care work. We can provide some lower bound estimates of what the time is worth with different replacement cost scenarios, but we can also show that, or we also need to show, figure out good ways to show that it generates really important um, public social benefits that are really crucial to our uh, social sustainability and the welfare of future generations. And that is the larger process of social re reproduction. Okay. I hope you'll have some comments. I hope you'll give me, give me some brief. And, uh, Criticisms as well as questions. Hi, uh, I'm Deborah Nunes, uh, fifth, no, sixth year PhD student at Colorado State. I'm old, okay. Um, thanks so much, that was amazing. And I want you to, if possible, I want to hear your opinions about just going deeper into this discussion of trying to measure output instead of trying to measure hours and how that would look like. Because when we start thinking of actual, what types of activity are there and who is providing the care and who is getting the care. And when you start thinking about, you know, self-care, for example, 
And if I don't give myself the opportunity to sleep enough, which I frequently don't because I'm a grad worker, um, my ability to actually care for others in the next day is worse. And if you do that repeatedly, actually you can become an abusive parent maybe and in, you're providing bad care effectively. So how, um, yeah, like what, what are some paths that you see or? Um, you mentioned self-care. That is very under-researched, and I think uh, there's a lot of scope for looking at that because uh, it falls under, you know, notice I was very careful to say production, development, and maintenance of human capabilities. And self-care is really important to maintenance, and um, human capabilities do depreciate, and they depreciate faster under some conditions than others. And um, I think uh, just efforts to conceptualize self-care are really s very sorely needed. And, but I think the empirical dilemma is basically the same as care for other people, that somehow we have to develop some multivariate uh, measures of, uh, and some difference in difference, <laughs> econo you know, econometrics of how changes in the care environment affect social outcomes. And there's some examples of that, you know, like uh, there's studies of the impact of austerity on public health outcomes. That's a, a really, really good ex example. And the, the effects are very strong. I mean, you, you can see across countries, Basu and Stuckler have done really, really interesting estimates of what, um, what austerity cost in terms of increased mortality. And no, we don't have to put a dollar value in human lives. We can say, look, this, this is something that should be on our dashboard of indicators that th if these policies are increasing mortality, then uh, we should be paying attention to that. And, you know, this whole approach got a big boost from Angus Deaton and, and Ann Case, who really publicized to the economics profession the declining life expectancy of American um, the American population and started out they were focusing primarily on white workers but now there's a lot of evidence that that uh, uh, mortality rates have risen among blacks as well it's very much a function of inequality and also it's very much a function of deterioration in the social climate drug addiction suicide alcoholism what they call deaths of despair those are very much related to the social climate and I think what we want to do is encourage more interdisciplinary measures of the social climate and then think about its causes. So just, just to cheer you on <laughs> a little bit, just think about how long it took to um, provide evidence of climate change and how many skeptics there were about climate change, but how uh, awareness of climate change has grown because of its visible effects and also because of more and more scientific research and scientists all around the world just resisting a lot of censorship and a lot of opposition to show, look, this is a problem. This is costly. We have to remedy this. And I think uh, that is, w th they are a model for us, I think. that, that and. And our work should also be able to strengthen their work. In other words, I think, actually, to me, the big, one of the biggest problems of the social climate is our apparent inability to cooperate with one another. And our inability to cooperate with one another is a major factor driving the, the global physical climate crisis. So I know it sounds like a, you know, Woo woo, <laughs> you know, uh, it's difficult to picture it, right? But we could reach for it. We could reach for it together and try and figure out ways uh, to move in that direction. Some of uh, Richard Wilkinson's work on the impact of inequality on public health also, I think, fits into this, this category uh, of research. 
And there's also a lot of sociological research out there on neighborhood effects, how the, the characteristics of a neighborhood affect individual outcomes. And you know, we inhabit this discipline that's so focused on individual characteristics um, and human capital, and we really need to break free of that uh, and enlarge our focus. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. That that was uh, that was great. I I have these really picky questions about some of the, Good. but I'm I'm not going to take those up. But I I was thinking you can, in. You can pick it. Well, that, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you. I'll I'll, I'll do them later. Um, but I, I was thinking in t of t trying to relate what you're saying with quite a few of the other papers, right? So I think. Um, Catherine and Yasri, is, is it Yasri? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, Madison's paper and, and Sonia's paper, yeah. all of which were in one way or another talking about the, the value of care work in itself, not in any economic sense. And it seems to me that there's a real there's a real dilemma here, because on the one hand, it just seems monstrous that there has been no reward for this work for millennia. On the other hand, you don't, I mean, you don't want to go with Gary Becker and say the household is just a firm, right? That, that, that you don't want the economy to be everything. And I just don't know what to do about that, so I'm hoping that you do. I solve this dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> You're not, I, I haven't communicated, this is exactly what, this dilemma, that's exactly what drove me in this direction. Exactly, okay? Because the Beckerian analysis of the household is just based about individual utility. If I do something, it must be that it rewards me. There's no, there's nothing in Becker about the value of those services to anyone else. Uh, you know, it's a very individualized and very monetized, and it's based on opportunity cost, for Christ's sake. I mean, think about opportunity cost. It has nothing effing to do with the value of your, of your work. I can, you know, the opportunity cost of my time is, you know, is really high. Does that mean I would be a better mom? I don't think so. Or a better cook? I know that's not the case. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's disconnected. Opportunity cost is completely disconnected from the actual value of the, of the services being produced. Now, I do think it is really dangerous to rely on replacement cost estimates because what I'm saying is some aspects of care provision are not replaceable. There is limited substitutability between commodities and non-commodities. And so we can't try and commodify it all. But what we can do is we can say, okay, look, here's the part that that theoretically there are some rough equivalents for in terms of the market. Here's a lower bound estimate of what it would cost to replace some aspects of this work. And then we can say, but on top of that, there are these uh, really important dimensions of, of public goods with specific consequences for health and well-being. Not for utility, not for subjective happiness, but for actual measures of capabilities. And this is part of our goal. We, we care, we should care about the intrinsic value of these capabilities in addition to any kind of market metric. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm overstating it. Like, yes, there's still a lot of thorny dilemmas, but I think moving away from trying to reduce, pushing for a dual accounting system, you know, like things that are, are, are replaceable and relevant to the money metric and things that aren't at least relieves some of the, at least some of that tension, I would hope. Um, my question is both to you and Dr. Brownstein because both of you mentioned how um, capitalism and patriarchy go hand in hand, and especially when it comes to like the care economy, and so. You know, one look at the internet and you'll know that, you know, conservatives want wives to be at home, have children, and take care of them to, like, properly ensure that they come out better people. Um, 
But then at the same time, there's capitalism not wanting to do that. So how would you explain those two differences between two very similar and like almost brothers in you know command concepts, and then this huge like uh, congruency between them? Heidi Hartman wrote a um, a very famous essay that influenced me as a graduate student called "The Unhappy Marriage." of capitalism and patriarchy. So I like to think of them as a kind of a, a couple um, in, a, in a kind of mating dance. <laughs> and uh, I don't think they're necessarily married. Um, but, uh, but what we see is the outcome of, of negotiations between groups based on class, groups based on gender, groups based on race, and groups based on national citizenship. And I think we see shifting alliances and coalitions around these factors. And that is what is shaping policy. So that means class is really, is really important and it plays a huge role um, in determining outcomes, but it's not the only one. And I think you, if you look at what's happening in the Republican Party, I think you have a really clear picture of that. It no longer really represents capitalist class interests mm -hmm. because in order to, win an election so that they could slash social spending, they have to appeal to what I would say are elements of racial and gender and heterosexual identity. So I, I think it's this sort of, I mean, this is what I, I like most about an intersectional analysis is that it explains the horrible political circumstances that, that we're inhabiting better than uh, uh, a kind of monocausal, monosystem uh, approach. Unfortunately, it doesn't provide us with a clear solution. I know, at least in like the childcare aspect of care work right now, there's a push for um, looking at cost of care measures instead of market rate measures, at least for wages, and I have not fully thought out my question on this, other than I know you, when we were talking about measurement, it seemed more on that cost benefit, um, trying to monetize all of these pieces. Um, I guess just reflecting on that cost of care measurement, and which isn't necessarily the outputs, it's the inputs, and can that be like one step towards something? Yeah. I think the economic reasoning that uh, is a really powerful economic reasoning that lies behind increases in childcare workers' wages is that it would reduce turnover and that turnover is a really important influence on child outcomes. And there is a lot of international evidence that that's the case, looking at countries that treat childcare workers as part the same way they teach public education uh, teachers. Um, but I think that the, you know the problem is to do that you have to you have to have a public system that sets wages based on its uh, uh, estimates of what would be optimal for the, for the uh, quality of care and for the living conditions of the of the workers and that's not what we have in the u s in fact we have this s really perverse system where um, there's a huge shortage of childcare workers but we can't raise the wages of childcare workers because then most of the people who need childcare wouldn't be able to afford it. And I think it, it, I think it reveals a big disjuncture um, in wages that's related to income inequality. It's exactly the same problem that we have in the housing market. That is, we have a huge shortage of affordable housing and we have an oversupply of uh, mansions because it's profitable uh, to sell upscale housing and it's not very profitable to sell downscale housing, is, which is very price elastic, right? So in the modern economy, if you're, if you're in an industry that has some market power and, and that is pretty um, producing a product that's pretty uh, inelastic with respe respect to price, which is partly a function of market power, but it could be that it's, you're producing it for affluent consumers, right? Then you can 
you can raise wages because you can pass the wage increases on in your prices, right? So the care sector can't do that. So the care sector is, is under current situation and the, under current circumstances, I believe that workers in the care sector are kind of doomed to immiseration in the absence of structural change. And it's not just the childcare workers, it's also the teachers and it's also the nurses. Uh, and it's also other, some other big occupations uh, in, in the care sector. And uh, you know, the Republican effort to starve the public sector of funds and defund government is, is also a factor that is gonna lead to the immiseration of the care of workers in the care sector as a whole, but if there is some uh, strategic lesson that we could draw from that, it it could be that building an alliance across industries, so that childcare workers and elder care workers who are a very disempowered group are in alliance with teachers and nurses who are more more middle class and. Uh, you know, sustainable jobs, and throw in a few public health physicians, right? Because <laughs> they're being exploited, right? So I think this, this is part of the rationale for thinking big about the care sector, to say, look, this is, this is a big sector of the economy. It's way more important than the manufacturing sector in terms of employment and its uh, impact on our future. And so, uh, there's a reason for workers and also for, 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 to some extent, for firms who are producing those services and um, municipal governments to kind of uh, get together to uh, develop a better kind of vision of the care sector as a whole, I don't know. In thinking about that, I'm, I've been thinking about the impact of hustle culture and how so many of those care workers are just living paycheck to paycheck and, and don't have time to build that alliance in the ways that we would like them or to engage and think about political uh, ideas. And then combining that with you know what's happening related to reproductive health freedom for women and how that's related to the labor market and other places of power for women. Um, you know, so the solution may be sending them back to the home in some ways to do the care work and, and engaging that care. Hold on, I lost where I was headed. Um, I just wonder, though, how we create space for that, particularly when many of us are, are overburdened or um, burned out or um, just trying to survive, particularly when those care workers are like, because they care, like it's gonna be really hard for them to join picket lines and do other things because they really do care if they're doing good quality care work as, as was mentioned earlier. I think uh, that, um, I agree with what you're saying uh, and that, that is like one of the big dilemmas that we're facing, right? But there have been some really successful organizing efforts among domestic workers who are really, really, a really disempowered group. And seeing the impressive work of Ai-jen Poo and others in that Domestic Workers Alliance, they have really made some big gains, including much better federal protections for uh, workers in uh, providing home and community-based uh, services. And I think the expansion of human community services in a lot of states is also, uh, to some extent, a function of, I mean, the example in California and Oregon of, of uh, alliances between disability rights activists and care workers to develop a, a consumer directed but unionized care force that's a really example that's an example of a brilliant organizing strategy and it's really taken off in a lot of western states but i think actually uh, the well well one thing is we should also be thinking about coalitions with consumers because it's in the interest of consumers to have, as well as workers, to have lower turnover and better quality care. Did you know, if, if you've if you seen this research on the US economy showing that when the unemployment rate goes down, mortality in nursing homes goes up? Unbelievable, I mean really significantly. And why is that? Because nursing homes can't afford to raise their wages when the unemployment rate is low. So nursing home workers leave and go get better paying jobs 
and the reduction in staffing care ratios leads to increased mortality in nursing homes. That's, I just mentioned that because that, isn't that a good example of empirical work on human capabilities that shows economic dysfunction? Mm -hmm. You know, unemployment rate goes down, death rates go up. I mean, so I guess, it just means that it's more important for us to explain this better. We haven't explained it well enough. We have to explain it in ways that really reach people who can make a difference. And we need to just have a coalition ourselves of people working in a lot of different areas, with a lot of different methodologies, with a lot of different ideas, but staying in touch and trying to put it all together into really solid research findings and then get those research findings out. That's within our power. You know, there are a lot of things that are not within our power in the current political but this, this we can do. This is our, you know, this is our world, right? And it feels so good to be a part of it. <laughs> I mean, just the presence, just your presence here and your engagement with the issue, that's what I'm talking about. And on that call to action and optimistic note for can we declare victory? what we can do. <laughs> well, victory is ours. Rarely. I, I just want to thank Nancy for that talk. And maybe we can give her a big round of applause. And if I can just have your attention for just a, a minute longer, um, I really want to thank everybody for being here, all the presenters, speakers, uh, and panelists. I think this was a long, very productive, very thought-provoking uh, day, and such a great opportunity to discuss research, share ideas, and learn. And so I just thank you for that. Uh, as you're all aware and was mentioned by my colleague Paul in the beginning, this workshop is named in honor of our late colleague, Tracy Mott. Um, one of the enduring contributions that Tracy made to the department is that he modeled an endless curiosity. I, I would also add an interest in trying to explain things well and in a way that matter to people, um, just to sort of echo that. Um, for many, many years, he ran our seminar series, and regardless of who the speaker was or what the topic was, and he was really, uh, I mean, I've gone through his private library. He was very interested in all ideas. Um, he would always be the first to ask a question or offer a comment, and the last who would want to stop the discussion. Uh, and we will have more time to discuss in more or for informal setting here in just a minute. Um, but by working to establish the Tracy Mott Fund and organizing an annual workshop on a specific topic, uh, we hope to honor Tracy's memory and preserve this legacy of curiosity and intellectual engagement in the department. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Tracy Mott Fund, you can talk to me about that. Uh, but putting the, work, the workshop like this together uh, also requires a lot of sort of work on the ground and in the moment. And I just want to specifically recognize uh, Melanie Assis, who was our uh, interim, um, and uh, well, she was our, our budget person and then moved out of the role, but still stuck with us to make sure this event went off. Uh, Carol Belfi, who Paula mentioned earlier, who's a new department assistant and was very instrumental in sort of helping me with logistics. Um, and I also want to mention, uh, mention Jamie Deneen, who was our previous department assistant, who put amazing documentation in place and started this whole workshop a uh, little under a year ago uh, and sort of left documentation that we could pick it up and get it over the finish line. Uh, so I think uh, very important and hats off to them. Uh, and then I want to also recognize the organizing committee, uh, Yavuz Yashar, Paula Cole, uh, Robert Urquhart, and Henning uh, Schwartz. Uh, they provided kind of the specific vision for today and helped refine it. Uh, and particular kudos for Henning for 
brokering the collaboration with the Forum for Social Economics and Yavuz for joining Henning as a co-editor on the special issue that we're hoping comes out of this. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, I want to thank the university staff. We got a video recording, we have food, we have drinks, uh, things happening in the background, uh, AV setting up, making sure this all happens. And so uh, I'm very grateful for their work in pulling this off and being at a university where the, these resources are available uh, so we can have these conversations. And with that said, please enjoy a beer, a glass of wine, uh, flavored soda, whichever uh, sparks your interest, and more discussion. Thank you.